All right. Uh, good evening again, everybody. Uh, we got over a, a thousand people in attendance. Let's uh, get this kicked off. Um, my name is Toby Bays. I'm the business agent here at Local 44. Um, on the dais, we have Secretary Treasurer Anthony Pollack, uh, Business uh, Representative David Elliott. And in the answering the Q&A, I've got representatives Angela Whiting, Crystal Danez, and Victor Reyes. Uh, we do have the qu question and answers open. Uh, please do not or refrain from using the uh, question section as a chat room. Uh, we had a problem with that in a, in a previous uh, webinar. Uh, Co-host uh, is Ashley Scally, and uh, this webinar is going to be limited to the presentation and discussion of the tentative agreement that was reached Saturday by the IATSC and the AMPTP. Um, this evening around 6.15, I believe everybody should have gotten uh, three PDF documents uh, regarding the details of the tentative agreement. This is not contractual language by any means, but it does go over some of the economics, uh, the streaming uh, changes and uh, working conditions as well. So. Um, it's pretty much some of the same material that I'm going to be uh, presenting in this webinar. So if you haven't had a chance, uh, that's going to be a good reference for everybody um, uh, after tonight or during this meeting. So I'm just going to get right into it. I'm going to go over uh, the bullet points of the tentative agreement and uh, we'll get into some of the bargaining issues that we had and uh, We'll go into right into questions and answers. Um, what we'll do is we'll bring you into the dais. Uh, please um, announce yourself and your craft and then answer your question. Let's keep it limited uh, to one or two uh, and not, too, not a whole series of questions. We'll give you an opportunity to get a couple in if they're not too heavy and then you have to get back into line. So, all right, so. 2021 basic agreement, almost six months in the making. Uh, we concluded the bargaining uh, on the Saturday evening. Um, on the economic improvements, we've got yearly uh, wage increases of 3% each year of the agreement compounded. Uh, that's uh, increases retroactive to August 1st. Um, we also have uh, significant increases to the lowest paid members in 871. Uh, that brings them up from a little over $16 to $26 uh, by, the, uh, by year three of the agreement. The pension and health is funded by the uh, employers during the term of the agreement and uh, ongoing in, uh, hourly contributions will result in $370 million of new money over the three-year agreement. Uh, we've also been able to secure the 13th and 14th check for those uh, retirees that um, retired before August uh, 2009. We are also able to secure, uh, secure increases to the on-call employees uh, who, who currently receive 60 hours of pension and health contributions uh, for the first five days weeks, uh, first five day work week. That will increase to 65 hours beginning August, 2022 and increase to 70 hours in that five day period uh, uh, beginning August, 2023. These 10 additional hours uh, are uh, equal to more than 16.5 increase in benefits per, uh, per week. Um, also improvements in the sick leave. The California sick leave that applies in our basic agreement would only apply previously, only apply to work being done in California. So if you were transported out of California to another state, you were no longer able to accrue uh, sick leave days. Uh, that has now been extended beyond uh, or across the United States. Have some uh, streaming updates as well. And I also have a graph that I'll bring up later as well. So high budget streaming rates, tier one and two, uh, that are currently on the long form, uh, or also known as MOW rates, have increased 15% uh, uh, on average for local 44 members. Um, and then that's an average of 675 or 657 per hour and as much as uh, $9 and uh, 93 cents per hour. Uh, mid budget uh, that was on a uh, long form side letter with two, uh, two rate rollbacks is now up to uh, current uh, long form side letter. Uh, low budget uh, is 
the interesting thing about the low budget is that nothing no less than low long form rates and MOW rates, uh, two years rollback. And now we also have uh, condition uh, working conditions attached to the low budget streaming. We'll get, uh, we'll get more into the, the details there. There's a lot to unfold. All right. Working conditions. <clears throat> we now alternatively have the strongest weekend turnaround uh, in the IA of all of any IA contracts either in the United States or in Canada. And 90 days after ratification of this agreement, hourly employees will receive a 54 hour rest period for a five day work week and a 32 hour rest period for a six day work, work, uh, work week. There are some exceptions and this is when it's important that night shooting happen exterior specifically. So when the scenario is that it's honest night shooting and there's limited access to a location or there might be health and safety concerns due to weather or natural hazards, they will have the, ex uh, the exception to reduce it to 50 hour turnaround for that weekend. Uh, they, they have the ability to limit it, uh, use it as a, a limited number of times, no more than once uh, every six weeks in an episodic and mini series once on a one-time motion picture, 66 minutes to 85 minutes in length, and twice in a, a theatrical motion picture or one-time motion picture longer than 85 minutes in length. Um, 95, uh, 90 days after the ratification of this agreement, uh, all employees on dramatic and non-dramatic, uh, SOV over 20 minutes long, will have a 10 hour daily turnaround. No longer will um, uh, a nine hour turnaround apply to pilots or first year, of, uh, first year series. It's across the board, all crafts, all, all locals. Uh, there are no more carve outs regarding the 10 hour turnaround. There is an exception for off production facility turnarounds that will remain at eight hours. So if you're off production and you work and you are assigned to a facility uh, area at a studio, the turnaround remains at eight, at eight hours. If you're off production assigned to production, the 10 hour turnaround will, uh, will apply to you. Also 90 days after the ratification, uh, distant, uh, higher uh, distant higher employees on all the same dramatic and non-dramatic will have a nine hour daily turnaround calculated portal to portal. That will put the the turnaround time in alignment with the area standards. Um, immediately upon ratification, uh, this is meal penalty. So immediately after ratification, after four meal penalties every hour, you will be paid a, a meal penalty of $25. This represents an 85% increase. And on uh, outside the studio location, nearby location, it's a 100% penalty increase outside the studio. On any given work week, after 20 meal penalties have been accrued, each half hour meal penalty will be paid at one hour uh, of the individual's prevailing rate. And I've got a graph for that. Let me pull that up. Uh, I'm gonna have to share later, Never mind. We also got a uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day is now a recognized holiday that will move the accrual of the holiday pay from uh, 3.71 to 4.0. This is applies to all union, unions and guilds, uh, whether it's the Northeast Corridor uh, or, or um, in the Hollywood Basic uh, Agreement. I'll get into more details on that when uh, we get into the bargaining discussion. So what's uh, so I'll just give some bullet points really quick. What's in the tentative agreement? We have pension and health hours fully funded by the employer. 13th and 14th uh, checks are secured for retirees. Improved wages, working conditions on streaming with the increased uh, range from 5% to 23%. Retroactive scale wages, 3% annually. We have uh, living wage for the lowest paid crafts, 871 from 1650 to $26. Uh, uh, over the life of the, of the agreement. We have increased in meal penalties, including prevailing rate. Uh, we also have a daily rest period of 10 hours, 
Now that now includes uh, pilots and first season shows, weekend rest of 54 for a five day, uh, 32 for a six day, Martin, Le uh, Martin Luther King Jr. birthday paid holiday. We have a diversity, equity, inclu uh, inclusion initiatives. We have additional MPI hours to increase uh, pension uh, of on-call employees. We have expanded sick pay uh, benefits for California to the entire country. And a small caveat, but it's really important to Local 44, it is now codified in agreement that car mileage is at the IRS rate for personal use of your vehicle. So hopefully we will eliminate the confusion between the uh, 30 cents uh, drive to uh, language and get IRS rates and that will free up a lot of our energy. What did the AMP want, AMPT want to do? When they came into this uh, uh, bargaining, one of the things they wanted to do was inf uh, implement what was referred to as flexible meals. Uh, and essentially what that breaks down to is French, uh, French hours without a vote. They kind of reshaped this a couple of times, but it was the same thing. They also wanted to re uh, redirect 1% of your IAP, which now is at 6%. Uh, and they wanted that contribution of 1% to go to the health plan. They also wanted double hours needed to qualify for a pension credit year. Um, as well under health and pension, they want to impose meet, uh, monthly premiums at $25, $60, and $100 per month. That was $25 for a single, $60 for couples, and $100 for uh, families per month. Uh, they wanted to eliminate the daily guarantee for day players after booking. Uh, they uh, proposed increase the threshold to uh, the 10% pension increase which has replaced the uh, 13th and 14th check. They wanted to reduce meal penalties for daily periods. They wanted to eliminate night premiums in a few locals agreements that still have them, and that's definitely us. Um, what did they achieve? They got a four hour minimum call for training days only. That excludes contract services. And they also got a weather permitting language to allow cancellation of a 12, uh, to allow cancellation within a 12 hour notification. So I want to kind of describe where we were at when uh, we came to the membership for a strike authorization. We had been bargaining for over four months at this point with very little uh, to show for it. I will say the AMPTP did just enough to bargain without creating uh, uh, bad faith bargaining. They just did enough to kind of drag this along. And most of the time they just ignored a lot of our economic and certainly ignored our quality of life issues. So before we sought the uh, strike authorization, uh, they were still very low on the, on the wages. They were still holding on the IAP uh, uh, diversion of 1% to the health plan. They were holding on to the qualifying hours of pension, which is some of the stuff I've gone over, quality of life issues. We had seen a tiny bit of movement on the 10 hour uh, work uh, turnaround, but again, they applied it unevenly as an effort to break the unions. They had some locals getting 10 hours and some locals not. Uh, and they held that ground uh, over many passes. Um, very meek uh, improvements on meal penalties that really didn't do anything to prevent buyouts. Um, they insisted on a flexible meal schedule. I talked about that again, essentially French hours without a vote. Uh, they were still holding on the night premiums to eliminate them. And they had made some small moves to the 871 members, but nothing uh, significant. And the on-call benefits they had completely ignored, okay? We got the strike authorization. Uh, immediately after the announcement, we were back at the table the very next day. Um, right off the first pass, we saw streaming rates increase from where we were previously. Uh, the pay equity moved, uh, but hadn't moved enough at that point. Um, On-call benefits, we got that increase. I'll get into some details there as well. We had, did secure the 10-hour uh, turnarounds for all unions and almost all applications. We achieved, and this is a big one because they absolutely were flummoxed at the idea of a weekend rest period as if it didn't exist anywhere else. 
And with sidebars and everything, that time and time again, they just would not move or even consider it. Uh, so on the first pass after the strike authorization, it wasn't where we wanted it to be, but we achieved the weekend rest period. And that was huge. Increased to mail penalties at that point, uh, improved. And then in the last, uh, next to last day bargaining, we were able to secure the accrual of 20 meal penalties um, after 20 meal penalties uh, to be paid at the prevailing rate when the, uh, the 21st one hits. The very beginning of bargaining, um, both the IA and the AMPTP had DEI initiatives that they brought forth. A lot of that DEI has, uh, a lot of it has to do with um, our continued uh, engagement with Sacramento. And um, we put forth both of our proposals. We spent a lot of time on this. It's a very uh, complex piece of, a, uh, of language. Attached to ours was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. After 18 years, this has been a federal holiday for 18 years, and we've never been able to secure it within the basic agreement and the AMPTP. And they used this like a pawn. They, uh, they, refused, they refused to let the Northeast Corridor people have it. They would only give uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day a consideration if the uh, national locals withdrew some of their existing um, holidays and replaced it. Um, and we did not move. So interesting enough to that for them to express the importance of DEI during this whole process, but completely failed to recognize the fact that uh, the holiday that celebrated the civil, uh, civil rights legend uh, was just too expensive. So that sort of sums it up. We'll get into some of the other, other details, but I want to talk about the bargaining process because I did touch upon this on the two town halls. I think there's been a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about this. Uh, you know, I, I talked about we, uh, the 13 locals agreed to circle the wagons to only put forward uh, group proposals that would apply to as many locals in the bargaining party. And we, over months, we developed those proposals. Um, and then we sort of thumbed through them. We got our, our proposals together to bring forth to the AMPTP. Bargaining began in May, May 17th to be exact. So in the bargaining process, there is a series of rules uh, that you follow to make sure that bargaining uh, continues to go forward. Uh, and these, some of these rules are laid out in the National Labor Relations Act. So at the very beginning of the process, both parties will bring their proposals forward and exchange those proposals. At that point, we'll either reject, accept, or counter proposals back and forth. Um, no agreement is complete uh, until the agreement is, uh, uh, com uh, no, no, no tentative agreement is in place until a full agreement is uh, agreed to. So once you've got those proposals across the thing, you cannot bring in new proposals. These are part of the bargaining process. Also, if you've made a, pro a proposal you and you have a tentative agreement, you can't basically leverage that tentative agreement or change your mind and say, I, if, I, don't, want to get, I don't want to give that, so I'm going to do this. That's called regressive bargaining. Um, in this process, we, we began with those proposals. We held on to many of our proposals. As I explained, the process was slow and painful. And at one point, when it was just completely stagnant and there was no movement, and quite honestly, they were on to the fact that we were already planning the possibility of a strike authorization, they decided to call us out and see what that strike authorization. Now that doesn't mean the bargaining process starts over. We weren't at an impasse. We were still bargaining technically, but they were gonna see where we were at um, with the strike authorization. And we felt that that was beneficial as well. So we paused the bargaining. And then when we got the strike authorization, we picked up right where we left off. And continue to bargain. And that was when things began to evolve and things got turned forward. So to be clear, after that strike authorization was given to President Loeb, it doesn't mean we can start changing our proposals and we do a redo. 
Um, and I think that's been sort of misunderstood along the way. So I'm going to share screen for a second, if I can remember. Everybody see that okay? Oh, no. All right, so I just, this is a, a local 44 streaming rate increase table that uh, David uh, Elliott drafted together. But this kind of shows you where the rates were in the streaming new, uh, the, uh, the streaming side letter and where they're going with this tentative agreement. So you have tier one rates and you have tier two rates. So right now on this ledger here, you've got where they exist now, MOW long form rates. And you can see the crafts here and where they move on uh, SVOD high budget, and that's to the basic agreement. And you can see the percentage increase from that one move. And then in tier two, which is basic agreement rates, uh, 2019 to 2020, that's two cycles rolled back, you see the percentage increase there as well. So I just thought that was important to see the significant movement of, um, of many of the uh, many of the new uh, new media side letter uh, provisions that are moving from MOW to uh, basic agreement or basic agreement two cycles back, and then this is just a quick um, thing about prevailing rates and what it means. And the example here is a property person, a uh, seven a.m. call is the basic rates uh, forty seven thirty nine. If the show passes at twenty meal meal uh, twenty meal penalties per week. Then for the two meal penalties, say between one and two, you would make uh, $47.39 for each penalty plus the hourly rate. And that brings you to uh, $142 for that meal penalty at prevailing rates. And then another example down below, uh, if you are in at, if the prevailing rate is at time and a half, two meal penalties, that could equate to $213 and uh, 26 cents. So I'm gonna leave it there. We're gonna open it up right away to questions. I know there's a lot of questions. So I anticipate that there's a, you know, a lot of hands up. So same thing, uh, Ashley will bring you in. Please announce, uh, say your first and last name uh, and your craft. And uh, we'll get through as many of these as we can. It looks like there's quite a few uh, question, uh, questions and answers at this point at 43. So Ashley, it's all yours. Go ahead, Michael. Hey, um, good afternoon, gentlemen. Michael Venture, prop maker. You know, um, you know, look, I know it's uh, been a, a long road, and you know, we sure are appreciative of all the efforts you guys make. Um, my just question is, that I just feel as if a lot of people are not happy with with the deal, and. If they do, if the membership does vote no, um, what's our what's the next step after that? Uh, I, I, thank you, Michael. That's a perfect question to start off. I know that's been out there. So I think there's a couple of possibilities, and I mean, I'll try. I mean, there's a, there's a few scenarios. Nobody really knows how it would lay out, but this is my concern. So. When we got the strike authorization and we were asking members about taking a, you know, a good faith effort, support the strike authorization. I know a lot of our members were completely uncomfortable with the idea of signing off on that. I would say uh, safely 50% of our members had trepidations about doing the strike authorization. But they put that aside and it shows solidarity and we got this outstanding turnout. Uh, turnout. My fear is that if this, if this agreement, this tentative agreement gets rejected, then essentially what we're gonna be doing is our strike authorization in reverse. Now I know it's an electoral process, but for example, the popular vote and 52% of the members reject this agreement. That is essentially our new strike authorization uh, numbers there. It's, not no, it's no longer 96, because what we've done is essentially divided the union between the people that are willing to go on strike uh, and, the, and the ones that were willing to agree to the agreement. So that's a big issue. 
we've now cut our leverage significantly. So that's a problem. Um, and I think that's one of my biggest concerns if this uh, uh, agreement gets rejected. Uh, there's, a, there's a few possibilities. The AAPTP could basically tell us, uh, you know, we'll see you in six weeks. Uh, my President Loeb would, uh, could also, uh, immediately authorize a strike. Uh, we could request to go back to the table. Um, it might give us a chance to bring more proposals, but I think one of the concerns is, is we would protect what we've already achieved. But honestly, I think, and, I, and I've said this before, strikes are dangerous. It's a big gamble. And it's, this would be a, uh, not the agreement to gamble with that. I know there's people that are disappointed with this agreement. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, on the face of it, this is a good agreement and I fully support it. And um, we shouldn't turn our back on this agreement. I think this is a type of agreement that we build off of. Um, the whole, our whole process in this uh, from the, is, was very different. And I, and I know that when we finished this agreement, everybody agreed in that room that we would never bargain the basic agreement the same way again. We showed a sign of solidarity uh, amongst the Hollywood locals that had never been seen before. And I mean, it wasn't always comfortable in the room, but we maintained our composure. We stuck together and through that whole process and quite frankly, it worked. And so I hope that we can foster this going forward. There's significant improvements here in uh, quality of life issues on, on weekend turnaround. It's not the, no agreement is gonna be the perfect agreement. But a lot of us in the Hollywood locals, we put our priorities aside. We embraced other priorities. You know, getting 13 leadership to agree on a set of proposals that was 19 pages was no easy task in itself. But through this whole process, we learned a lot about each other, about the agreements, and what are some of the issues that we're gonna have to continue to address. And I know on call is one of them. And we've already had discussions with those other locals and their on call issues. And we learned a lot about the on call issues of other locals. So there's a, there's a couple of things. I think there's a statement coming out tomorrow that will spell out very specifically or the possibilities um, of that, uh, of a no vote. And, but I really want to encourage everybody to vote yes on this agreement. Um, and move forward. This is not, this doesn't end here. I've heard the rhetoric about lost opportunities and things like, no, this is just a start. We can build on this. We've got to stick together. And I said it at the rally, look, this is bottom up stuff and it doesn't stop here. And I think that's a critical thing to consider. It doesn't stop here. No agreement is going to be the perfect agreement. No agreement is going to address everybody's issues and everybody's concerns. But we, it's always, that's why we do it every three years, right? So we can uh, adjust and uh, and catch up to what those issues are. So, thank you, Michael. All right. James, uh, name and craft. Yeah. Hey, Toby. How are you? It's uh, James Bennett, uh, hey. property. Hey, uh, Anthony. Hey, David. So I'll make this real quick. I um. I'm a, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a yes vote at this point. I've kind of, um, I've done a 180. I've just been doing a lot of thinking about this. You know, my, I'm a creature of my craft, which is, uh, I'm off production. You know, I show up at six, I go home at 18, five. I take breaks when I feel like I need one and I eat food when I'm hungry. You know, I basically just do what I'm told and, and eat what I'm told to eat and go home when I'm told to go home. So my main concerns and, and, and not that I don't feel for people that are on production, because I totally get, like I did the on-set commercial thing. I did all that. I understand the whole turnaround. It's got to be brutal. I trust, Toby, I trust you. I trust uh, your judgment in all of this. My concerns have always been with my, um, my health benefits. And, um, and there was something else, but... But uh, David Elliott um, had uh, answered Tony Andreas's question. And so, David, this is kind of for you. I'd like you to explain to me, and really briefly, I, I want to make this quick. 
Uh, um, explain to me how we're getting 10% increase in our health benefits or how I think maybe, 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 actually I'm paraphrasing. I think you said something like it equates to 10% of a raise or something, because I guess I understand that we're still getting just a 3% raise. Um, uh, I would, uh, of course, hey, like anybody else, I'd like to see four or 5%, but whatever, 3%. Um, but you were saying that it's actually more because of our health benefit contributions. Briefly explain to me how that works. And if you don't want to do it here, you can send me an email. And then my second question is, when do we get to, re if this goes through, when do we get to revisit our contract again? How many years? Two, three years? Thank you, guys. Okay, right, so David, and then I'll follow up with that last yeah, part. I'll just answer the second question first, which is that the three years from now, we will go through this whole process again. And as far as the 10% uh, overall wage and benefit increase, um, to fund the health care and the pension and to adjust for the incredible increase in the rise of our fantastic health care, um, the producers had to pay an additional 40 cents an hour um, if uh, they did not pay, if they paid more than $15 million in residuals a year and $1.20 an hour um, if they don't pay more than $15 million residuals uh, per hour. So basically for the standard rate, that's a 9% increase. And for the non-standard rate, that's a 19% increase. And when you add those two together with the 3% wage increase, that comes to a 10% wage and benefit increase the first year, a 16% wage and benefit increase the second year, and a 27% wage and benefit increase the third year because those dollar 20s compound to where there's an additional three dollars and sixty cents being paid per hour worked for your health care um and again uh, just you know before um uh one of the reasons for that is that health care is more expensive but another reason is that there are so many more treatments available. And I shared this before. Um, you know, I had cancer last year and I had over a million dollars worth of treatment and now I am super healthy. And uh, 12, 15 years ago, I'd be dying right now. So um, that's a, a pretty big value for me. And it didn't cost me a dime. All right. Well, thank you, David, very much. And uh, and again, um, I think at this point, yeah, I'm a yes, just because I, I've, I started off as a real kind of disgruntled, like, oh, well, hold on. What the ham sandwich is going on here? I thought we were going to get a better raise. I thought we were going to start seeing some more money in our pockets, because I'm going to tell you right now, as a single full-time father of two kids, 17, 21-year-old, I'm paying money. You know, I pay rent. I got bills, you know, just like everybody else, you know, my gas has gone up $2 more a gallon in the past two years. So, you know, I, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm just kind of hoping that um, that in three years, because I know it's going to be worse than better. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've just always seen that, you know, the cost of living. And when I say worse and better, I'm just saying the cost of living, it will be worse than it will be better. It's not like it's not like all of a sudden my rent and everything and my cost of education for my kids is going to go down. I don't expect that. But what I would like to see is an increase in our in our wage and raise because I am from the old school. It's like you guys understand 15 years ago when when we were making deals about experimental streaming media. And now these guys are making billions and the whole argument of like, how come that's not trickling down to us and get all that you know it, it's not going to happen this this time around james if i'm going to if i could just yes sir address that because i understand exactly what you're saying and um they're the they fact got theirs, that, they got theirs how come we don't get ours That's well awesome. I, i'm i'm going to address that okay so everyone gets a three percent wage increase to any wage at any rate but if you're working on a show next year that would have been 
at the movie of the week rate this year. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, James, you're a prop maker, right? I'm um, property, uh, code number uh, uh, 7369. Okay, so you'll be making $7 an hour more next year on a streaming project than you will um, this year because of the improvements in the new media rates. So, um, you know, frankly, I hope you're working on a, a television series and making the basic rate. Um, and one of the higher rates, like 75% of our members do, but if you were working on one of those um, lower budget shows, you'll be making $7 more an hour in your pocket after 2022. I saw, I saw that. And I think that's beautiful. And that's one of the main reasons why I am going to vote yes. I'm supporting you guys. Like I said, I, I don't know much about uh, Anthony or or you, Mr. Elliott, but Toby has been there for me before in the past. And and I just, so I just kind of trust your leadership at this point. So I'm going to mm -hmm. end this. I just want to say thank you for all the hard work. Um, I've done a 180 on a lot of this. Um, and, and in three years, um, you know, I guess we can just build on this. I think that's... Uh, yeah. I think that's where I'm at. So, hey, good night, guys. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We, 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 we should take every advantage of this momentum and, and, and move it forward. Also realize that those increases from MOW to the uh, basic rates, uh, either a current or a two cycles back, also puts a larger number into your IAP, which is still at 6% uh, of your straight time work, which is significant. That's a, that's a savings account that doesn't work into the cost of living index. Um, and it's been there and it's been, and we've built on it. I mean, I think it started at 34 cents or something like, or 18 cents an hour or something like that. I, I don't remember the details, but we've been able to sort of build on that and, 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 and defend it essentially. Uh, go ahead, uh, Joe, name the craft. Uh, Joe Martinez, uh, prop shop. Um, I'd like to think, thank you guys for being there when we started this strike authorization vote and how we rallied the troops. A lot of the troops wanted to see a little bit more movement in, in the basic agreement. Um, it, we feel that, I feel anyway, that you took the first deal that they had down the pipeline and I, you say good faith negotiations, but they've been kicking the can down the road since July. And this whole back and forth, back and forth, they didn't respond, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. And we still, let, we still let them go beyond the contract deadline. So I think we need to put a time limit on our time limit to give them more time to, to say no or to not even respond to us. But all that aside, I think that's kind of what frustrates everyone right now because the minute we're ready to, to, to mo motivate the troops, you guys shut everything down. And I think it would have been beneficial if you had allowed the strike to happen or given us a, a few days to review this before we ever said, yeah, no strike. We should have went on strike, in my opinion, to show them exactly that this is one week of no production, no movement whatsoever. And then they can take that monetary expense and go, geez, this is what it's going to cost us if we don't play ball with them. That's my opinion. That's my, my, my focus on it. But yeah. in two years, are we going to have the same problem of pension and health care not being funded correctly? And part of the reason I'm not having it is because primary streaming residuals don't happen. Now it's on secondary markets. It's always been secondary markets, Joe. That's, that's the confusion. I know I texted you about the difference, right? You're comparing sort of residuals from... Uh, SAG, DAG, and WAG, um, and it's just, it's always been a different structure. All of our residuals have been generated through secondary uh, distribution. Well, so, how is a, a show that is produced by a network streamer, how is that ever going to reach a secondary market? The Mandalorian is not going to be transferred over to another another uh, market. It's going to stay on Disney+. Plus. We, we, we just don't know that. And there's AVOD services they could distribute it to. They're not going to hold back distribution because they're afraid of paying a, a small percentage of residuals. They're going to move that product wherever it needs to move to be profitable. And so we really don't know what we don't know. And there's going to be a lot that is going to unfold. I mean, streaming and we have a multitude of subscription-based things. 
I don't think they're all going to survive. That content's going to go somewhere. There's going to be some consolidation. I think everybody can kind of feel comfortable with that notion. Um, this hasn't figured itself out. And right oh, now wow. we're in an arms race to be who's going to be the most significant, uh, who's going to grab the most su subscribers and be king of the hill. See, um, you're, you're, you're saying it's what we don't know, but we do know this. We gave them a discount to get streaming off the platform, and now it's profitable. And we still are to now 12 years before we remove the new media label on this experimental project. And yet they are extremely profitable. Yeah. And we still don't have any language saying in two years, this experiment is over and we're going to go to full rate. Is, and, and that's kind of the problem that everyone has understanding it. You guys don't simplify the contracts. You make them so difficult where on a Tuesday at 3.30, if the moon is here and the sun is here and the wind blows west, we're going to have a, a, a day off or, or, or it's going to be more profitable. It doesn't make sense to have this many complicated issues when it should be a very simple thing. We do a job that all these crates weigh the same, all these things weigh the same, but we're giving it at a discount, but we don't have anything in writing that says this ends now. And in two years, you go to full rate. That's a problem. And I see that if we keep, you guys, and, and forgive me if, if this is disrespectful, but you guys didn't see streaming coming in and becoming a subscription-based situation that dominated the industry. And, and you guys are negotiating on our behalf and we're carrying the heavy load and they are getting away with it. And we don't have anything in writing that says this ends now. And that's why oh. I think it's important to have the strike authorization, which is right. historic. But we took the first deal down the pipeline. We, we swung at the first pitch and we punted on second down. No, and that, that's Joe, that's just not true. And I don't know how you would think you would know that. But I, I explained to where we were at. When we when we weren't moving anything, right? We didn't have we didn't have weekend turnaround. We didn't have anything solidified regarding wages. Nothing moved. I mean, like I think the only two things we had tentative agreement on was I don't even think a DEI uh, diversity, but we had weather permitting calls, and I think the uh, the DEI, which was the first thing, those are the only two tentative agreements we had in place when we called for the strike authorization. Doesn't mean that there was some bargaining, there was, there was some back and forth, but it was minute. Now, one of the things too that I expressed in the, uh, earlier in the town halls is that we knew this process being virtual was gonna be difficult and slow because we, we saw how it rolled out when the, re, the first return to work agreement was bargained, four months. That was from the ground up. But I don't think they were prepared for us because they were playing wounded, they wanted rollbacks. They thought we were uh, we weren't desperate to keep the industry going. That because of the five month, I think they uh, they 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 miscalculated uh, this whole thing from the very beginning. I agree uh, with that. I, I, yeah. and we all see that, but I think you also miscalculated something in our membership, and that we went out and we got every person involved. We got people that never have been involved to be involved. We got them all to show up. So we missed an opportunity. That's that's. I, Joe, I disagree because I, I was very clear at the very beginning of this, that the goal was not to get a strike. The goal was to get the best deal that we could get. And and I, I, I will I, I will stand by that straight strikes are dangerous. Yes, absolutely. And that's not and it what doesn't take long before whatever you possibly could have gained has been diminished by being on strike. And then that has a, a, an effect on the hours and the, and the health plans and things of that nature. But I think it's not word, Joe, word, Joe, can I, I, you know, let's not get into a debate. We can follow up. And I know I own you a phone call. So but my, um, my, my I, only question is, is the, 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 the word, the best deal we can get. That is a problem in negotiation tactics because no one gets what they deserve. They get what they can negotiate. And I think, and I believe, and a lot of members believe it also, that we're, we're always negotiating from behind. And that's Joe, Joe, let me address that, if I may. Please. On Monday morning, September 20th, 
the AMT PTP refused to negotiate. And that's when President Loeb asked for a strike vote because after four and a half months, they were saying no to, they were saying they were holding strong on reducing your wages, reducing your IAP to pay for health care, increasing qualifying hours for pension and eliminating the pension cost of living increases. They were ignoring quality of life issues like weekend turnaround, 10 hour turnaround for everyone, meal penalties that would prevent buyouts. They were taking away night premiums and they were ignoring pay equity. And because of your vote and the incredible motivation of our members, we were able to push back against companies like Comcast, AT&T, Amazon, Apple, who were trying to break or give the union a haircut because they thought that we wouldn't be tough enough. I understand that. But how many months was it from July till September 20th? How many days? Because if it took that long and they kept saying no, why did we wait to get the strike authorization? Joe, Joe, I, look, Joe, it worked <laughs> out well because it got us in alignment with the area standards. Uh, and not far behind it was the 52 agreement and the Teamster agreement got pushed back. It worked out well because we were able to basically get in line with the area standards. And we knew this was going to be a long process. Nobody thought it was going to be that long but they clearly didn't want to move and they thought we would fold. No, I don't think the IA has ever put a, a strike authorization under the basic agreement and it proved to be incredibly fruitful. But as I explained before, we had already started bargaining. We already brought those proposals forward. So to think that this was going to be a reboot is just not a feasible, but it delivered our priorities. And we explained those priorities uh, clearly. This is a, this is not, this should not be seen as a missed opportunity or um, a victory on their part. I don't think they feel that way at all. They, they, I don't, and I don't think anybody can say that they've seen an agreement like this. This is a good agreement. We should support this fully. I, we I'll, should grow upon this and not, we should, we should implode on ourselves, divide ourselves, Instead, we should foster this going forward. And this is what we've needed. We've always talked about that internal organizing, like how can we get that outreach beyond 10% or 15%? And we did. And it was, and a lot of people took a big risk. That's what solidarity is about. You have to put away your own personal um, grievances or your own personal wants for the greater whole. And a lot of people did. A lot of people authorized that vote and they were very, very uncomfortable. Because I, I felt, I, I feel a lot of those calls and they delivered and we, and, that, and it worked. I mean, immediately we saw a uh, huge increase and we just kept going. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you an example. And I know we're getting, it came down to the, the last two things. It was the 871 rates and the on-call. And I mean, that was, I think from their point that these were the two smallest groups. Are they really gonna risk a strike over a few, like I think it was three more dollars for the uh, uh, coordinators, the, the APOCs and the script uh, coordinators and um, some additional funding. And that entire room stuck together, stuck together. And it was, I tell you, it didn't, nobody, nobody was comfortable with that. We stuck together and we, and they went back and it, they went back more than once and nobody budged. And that's how it worked. We got that. It's like I said, it's never going to be a perfect agreement. We're not going to be able to address everybody's needs, but this was a significant win. And I'd hate to see us pull it apart for hurt feelings. We can address these issues. There's a lot of cultural issues we're gonna to have to address. I know they've been turning up the heat in production for a long time. What can we do? We're gonna to have to organize ourselves and we should start preparing for that next three years. But, but didn't we say that in the last- uh, uh, I wasn't around, Joe. No. But I, Joe, I Joe, you've had some time. Let's, we, we can talk. I owe you a phone call. Let's not, let's, I, I don't wanna- Thank you yeah. guys for having this. Thank you for doing all the work that you do. Thank, Thank you, Joe. You, Joe. Anthony Namencraft. Hey, Tobe, just to give you a heads up, it's the other Anthony. 
Uh, we got a lot of hands up, so we're gonna probably we gotta get people through. So I know everyone has questions, but we got a lot of people in the in the queue. So FYI, just keep them coming, Ashley. Uh, Anthony, name it, Craft. Max Bozeman, name it, Craft. <laughs> name it, Craft, Max. <laughs> Hey, Max Bozeman, Property Master. Um, hey, Max. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, guys. I know this has been challenging. I know you're getting a lot of, uh, catching a lot of flack. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I just, I did, wanted to ask one question. Um, I saw uh, that there was a possibility that um, that new members coming in at the beginning Beginning of this new contract, if it is ratified, would have to have 800 qualifying hours. Is there any truth to that question? No. Um, no change. It's 400 for a pension year. 400 for pension year, including new members that get in. Yeah, okay. no change. All right. Glad to hear that. You um, wanted to make that change, and your vote prevented that from happening. Okay, good to know, because... Uh, Somebody I believe many of us trust, not myself, but uh, said that that was a possibility. So uh, let's see here. Uh, my other question would be, um, uh, does the membership working under the ASA um, get to vote on this contract, uh, the membership themselves, or is it a, a delegate vote? No, they're, they're they going to get voting. to vote. And they're gonna work from what I understand. Um, the company, <clears throat> what's in the what's in the pipe? So they're right now they're bargaining in the area standards agreement right now. They're they're finishing that. The plan is to have both of those votes to ratify both agreements uh, run parallel, just like we did the strike authorization. Okay, um, and then I just wanted to uh, to address. Um, something that you just said to Joe at the end of the conversation was um, changing the culture. And um, I, I have been a massive advocate of changing the culture in our business for a very long time, as I'm sure you well know, David and Anthony. Um, and one way that I believe that we need to do this, and I believe that our membership needs to listen loud and fucking clear do not start work before your fucking call time. Don't open your truck. Don't unload shit. Stop it. Yeah. It, this, is, this is a problem. It's been a problem for a very long time. It's a culture that's been deeply ingrained in all of us. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Guess what? We need to stop showing up so goddamn early and giving away our free time. You wanna show up and have breakfast, great. Don't show up and unload the trucks. You get hurt, it's not, it's on your time, it's not on their time. I've seen it happen several times on location where people have actually been hurt and it's a problem. So please, I'm begging all of the membership that I know, all of the membership that I don't know, don't work on your free time. Yeah, Matt, you're, you're, you're like, and I, I'm guilty of it too, but you're right. What we've done is we've delivered time and time again as they've turned up the heat and they've compressed and we keep delivering, we can deliver. It's like, all of a sudden, now we know where we're at and, we're, and we've been making accommodations and we need to start talking about that. And it's frustrating because we have department heads that are IA members that might be working against the best interests of their crews. And we have other locals that supervise other locals it's a problem. And internally, we've been discussing that. And whether it's a DP, an art director, or a construction client, there are these problems. And I, I said it before, I'll date it one more time, and I won't, I won't quote it again. Nobody hurts 44 like 44. If we can address those internal issues and start advocating for ourselves, and that's a big, but it is a cultural thing. It's taken a while to get there. It's going to take a while to get back. But let's start making accommodations uh, so that we're not working every weekend. And, uh, you know, and by God, the fucking producers better listen to us or, or listen to what happened. And they better pump the brakes or this is just going to come right back at them in three years. So I'm hoping they heard. And it's not just 
basic, it's area standards, it's Canada. Uh, yeah, they're going to have to reassess. And I look, I, with the support we got from SAG, and I mean, there were tons of producers that were appreciative of this. Hell, there was even people on the opposite side of us, the LR people. So thank you, Max. Uh, Teresa, uh, name and craft. Hi, Teresa Corvino, Property Master. Um, thank you guys for doing this tonight. I think the more opportunities we have to talk as membership, the better, you know, equipped yeah. we all are for this. Yeah. Um, my question specifically regate, uh, is relegated to the pension plan funding. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to understand, I know there was a talking point throughout a lot of our updates as we went through negotiation or, you know, we would come back and um, yeah. you would update the room about, you know, trying to gain additional residuals, new media to help with pension solvency. And it seemed like that something was something that felt like shifted at the 11th hour when bullet points were released, that it moved from a possibility of additional streaming revenue to direct contribution, employer contributions. And I'm trying to find out when that happened in the room, what, why that happened in the room and how that, you know what I mean, how that affects our pension looking forward. What it seems like we're looking at funding for the next three years, which seems to just kick the can down the line one more cycle and leaves us on that edge of funding that we've existed at. Yeah, so I would say that the increment funding was happening prior to the strike authorization. And David and Anthony, if you could, you know, it's been a long haul, but they started making proposals uh, to the hour, increasing the hourly contribution, whether you were a 15 million contributor and, wh and where you were not. So I know that there was some counter proposals there as well. Um, you know, I, I know where this is going. And there was a little bit we touched about with Joe. We did not achieve, um, streaming residuals. Um, it doesn't mean the fight's over. And that that thing is like, I mean, we've had turnaround and weekend proposals in this basic green agreement for four cycles. And, you know, we kind of saw what was turning up the heat and we needed to address those quality of life issues. And we made it more of a priority because we were getting the dollar we needed. It is kicking the can down the road. Absolutely. But we now have some of those quality of life issues out of the way, and now we can start addressing other issues. So there's the notion that this is over because we didn't grab it at this time, I think is just false. Um, and we're gonna see how streaming starts to lay out and how that you know information, but we're still, I believe we got $214 million in streaming contributions in the last three years of the agreement. That's significant. I think it's 42% now. So. It's happening. Uh, we still get those residuals, but you're right. I think that's always going to be a target, and you know we'll see. It's it's you know it's bargaining. So that's why it happens every three years. Uh, you're not going to get everything. They're not going to get everything, and you just keep plugging along and uh, live to fight another day. And streaming works both ways. Every time you watch The Office or Friends on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, that is creating a residual that is paying for your pension and health plan. Um, it works both ways. It's not just the streaming content that goes outside, um, but it is that as well. And, and you have to uh, appreciate that our employers are greedy and they want to capitalize on as much revenue as they can. And that's why the successful streaming shows will be sold cross-platform. HBO doesn't play, pay initial platform residuals either, but the DVD sales and the, the rentals on Amazon for shows like The Wire or uh, The Sopranos or you name it are providing significant residuals into our health and pension plan. Just Amazon's purchase of MGM library. Yeah. So I should stream Netflix on the background while I'm working to fund my pension. Um, I, I understand that. I know we're not going to get everything every round. It, it just feels concerning where our, our pension sits in solvency right now. That, I mean, I know we're not going to hit, God, I hope we're not going to hit another COVID, right? Like that would create a crisis moment for us again. 
but it just feels like we're on the edge of that crisis moment. And you watch the numbers from 2019 back to where our funding was in 2015 and streaming contributions dropped by 17%. You know, we doubled the amount of our funding through investments, which is a lot more of a rocky market than, you know, employer contributions or streaming resident uh, residuals. Yeah, we're on target. For, I think, is it a... Is it a 15 year goal? I think we're, we're, we're above that target. Yeah, look, it, it, there's always gonna be um, natural forces or market forces or things like that. But um, it's also important too that we continue. It, look, we're seeing growth in the pension, it's continuing. We're gonna hit our goals, I think even before um, the projections went in place. Um, and, We'll see, there's a lot of things that we could address. It would be great if we could get uh, the federal and state government to address the, the medical um, inflation, which you know we, a lot of us thought. And I think, I think uh, the Affordable Care Act did address some of it in California, but we're still, we're no longer uh, double digit, but we're still high in the single digits. And, you know, and, and, and so far we've been able to bargain that gap every time. So it's still working. We were getting a dollar where we needed the dollar, but we also were able to address some, you know, significant uh, working conditions areas, which I, you know, the 50, the weekend turnaround is great. And, you know, we'll build on that going forward. And uh, yeah, like I said, we, that's why we do it every three years. I hear that. Said, Clark, uh, David Kraft. Yeah, Clark James, special effects. Um, most of my questions have been getting answered. Thank you guys. And, uh, but one remains, I was curious what, uh, if there were any changes to the hours bank, uh, we've run into that challenge before, but uh, any changes there? No, uh, it remains at 450. Awesome. Okay. That's all I had moving on. Oh, thanks Clark. Uh, Brad, uh, name it craft. Go ahead, Brad. I uh, gotta unmute yourself. You... Brad? Keep them coming, Ashley. Alicia, name a craft. Alicia Haverlin, property master. Hey guys, so I'm, I'm gonna keep it just the three questions. You can go ahead and mute me and I swear I will just yell at my computer afterwards. Toby, I know you keep saying that you're really scared of a strike and I completely hear you, I understand, but can you just tell me in the last 85 years, when have we lost a strike? I just want to know what the, no, 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 let me, I'll just say all three and then you guys can totally answer me. Okay. I promise. Okay. My next question is, if this is the best contract we are ever going to get, when is the last time we have seen gains? Why would you possibly think that in three years when they are richer, when they have more lawyers, when there are less of them because Amazon has bought three of them, that we are going to do better in that room. And my third question is for David Elliott. A couple of days ago, you told one of my brothers in this union that if we vote no, we are going to get what we deserve. I would like you to tell me what we deserve. I'm good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alicia. Go ahead, David. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure who she's referring to or when. Um, I, if I, I said if we vote no, that uh, you get what you deserve. Um, All right, so the, the strike things. When have we ever lost a strike? I, was that the question? I just have so. My, my question was in the last 85 years, since we have not mm -hmm. had an entire union strike, when have we lost a strike? What leads you to believe that we would lose a strike? We've lost I just small empirical strikes. evidence. We've lost small strikes. It doesn't, it, it doesn't really- It's, it's not, not about small strikes. This is about a giant IOTSI strike. This is about the largest labor movement in a generation where <sighs> everything, as you said, Toby, earlier, everything aligned, absolutely everything. Why wouldn't we take the chance to at least tell us what is in this agreement before you call off a strike? We gave you a 98% vote Everyone, Look, that's everyone. That is 600 voting to strike. Right. 
and again, I, I, we, I said in the beginning that I would, it wasn't about going on strike and, it, it, and it's a reckless thought. So it doesn't, it's irrelevant if 85 years or IA, we have seen strikes and we've seen how they've imploded. We've seen how it hurts people. Um, it's, it, again, it's very risky. And then you got to see from the producer standpoint, do you think if we go on strike, we better go on strike when they come after our pension, when they come after our IP, when they, when they really come after us hard. Like when, if we ever find ourselves in a position where we've had a market collapse or something like that, that's when people go on strike when they're really it's coming out of the throat. You don't come, you don't go on strike when we're getting these gains, we build upon these gains. So when I think there's a, there's a time and a, a place to have that fight, right? You know, a lot of this is bargaining. You know, we like, I, as I mentioned before, we masked our tanks at the border and we saber rattled and we got a lot from the value out of that. And that was good. This isn't a lost opportunity, but I think there's a right time to, agree, uh, to go on strike and there's a wrong time to go on strike. And these were significant gains. And you don't put that on the line to satisfy uh, somebody's desire to go on strike. That's not, Kobe, that's just reckless. People are dying. People are dying. We lost an AD because he couldn't take a single second away from a show. I went from one show and then he jumped in a show Atlanta and he dropped dead from a heart attack on Saturday. So it really doesn't matter it. about losing my health and my pension if I'm not going to make it to 65. I thought people are not sleeping. Computer. People are not doing it. Right. You're right. Not, you're not seeing people sleeping on sets, Toby. I am. I'm seeing it. My guys are seeing it. Everybody in this union sees it. There are people who don't walk. I thought you were going to scream at your computer. Um, so I want to, I want to make it, I, I have a very clear understanding of the pressures of production and where it's come from. I'm guilty of overdoing it. I'm guilty just as much as anybody. Some of these things we're going to have to address ourselves. We're going to have to have a, a, a bit of accountability as well. One thing that frustrates me is that we don't benefit from the agreements that, that we already have. We've been working against ourselves for too long on these issues. And so you're right. I think we're seeing that sea change. And by God, we better hold it together and push it forward as opposed to imploding. I, I stand by this position. This is how bargaining works. We're in a leadership position, and that's what you put me in this job for. So whether you like it or not, you have the right, you have the ability to vote, and you can vote your conscience. But I stand by exactly my position and where we were at, this was a good agreement. It didn't mean we should be going on the street, uh, the, the sidewalks and putting it at, um, at risk. Next one, uh, Ashley. Kevin, uh, Kraft and uh, uh, Damon Kraft. Kevin DeWire, I'm in 44 property and 800. Um, I think just uh, maybe less more of a note than just a question. Um, when Loeb came out and said this was the Hollywood ending, it was like a gut punch because everybody on my crew feels like we came up short and our basic needs were not met for changing the culture uh, in this industry. Um, and I think that just the general mood I've been experiencing has been ex extremely negative. And I just was wondering uh, why give up the opportunity with uh, with the maximum the maximum amount of leverage to then lower our leverage with like you said a fifty two percent or fifty three percent the next round if we wrote no to ratify then the next round we go into we're going to be in a, a less position why why give up the strong position for the lesser position when obviously the the temper temperature in the room is pretty bad. Well. Again, I, I, I mean, is there expectation that, I mean, I know, well, why didn't we get 12 on or 12 off or these things like that? Again, that was never a part of our original uh, proposal package. So we went and got a strike authorization to get what we got. And that's exactly what it delivered. And I know, and, and I, I think we were all aware that expectations were gonna be very high. Uh, because of that tremendous turnout. And I knew we were going to deliver a strike authorization, but I don't think anybody in their wild imagination was going to uh, see where it was. 
So again, that's a, a weapon. And I assured everybody that if we got that strike authorization, that we wouldn't be reckless with it. Um, again, I think that strike authorization delivered a tremendous amount uh, across the table that we weren't able to move on. And I think they were, and they, and look, they underestimated us. Uh, they underestimated our resolve from the very beginning. Is it a lost opportunity or is this something that should mobilize us in something that we should uh, grow from and continue this thing? Again, my, I, this would be a horrible opportunity to waste by the ire against this issue. Why are we, why are we attacking each other on these things? And look, my position, I, I expect to take some of the heat and all that, but this shouldn't be a lost opportunity. This should be an opportunity that we build on. And I mean that, I really mean that. I knew that was the, one of the biggest issues coming to this position is that we need to get organized ourselves to address our own issues internally as well and culturally. So um, I think, I think, um, I think I th uh, what I maybe I'm just trying to get, maybe get across is that um, like having a coordinator get paid the half of his amount of a set dresser and, and considering it like a, a Hollywood ending to me is this like, like, and then having to go see my coordinator on Monday and looking and her, you know, seeing her and seeing her completely, you know, gutted and, and calling that a Hollywood ending is just, it's just for me, the way it was framed by the media, by variety, by deadline, by low, by everybody on Monday, like, we had one, but then going to work and then everyone feeling dejected. I think there's a there's a there's a, a gap between what this what the perceived outcome was and what the reality on the floor was. And we're just trying to let you guys know we appreciate the hard work and like I know this is a process, but mm -hmm. I have I have the feeling that a lot of people who were never really invested in the union and cared and wanted to be a part of it just it's a paycheck and whatever has been poked the bear. And now there's a lot of people who never asked any questions or want to be involved or like, and then realize we, we did all this, we got all this leverage. And then we, this is, we got what we had before basically is this now I think people are waking up to the fact that we really don't have that much leverage and we really do need to make a change. And we really do want to go and uh, you know, do what we can to make a difference. But I think maybe this time around it's just, you know, it's like a wake up call for a lot of people. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'll stop there, but I, I just no, want I, you guys know that the, the mood, the mood on set and, uh, you know, is just, is pretty bad. And it's probably the worst I've ever, I've ever felt it. And I just want to let you guys know that it's, that's what it is. So thank you so much. Yeah, you look, uh, I, you know, look, that's, that's, you're right. I mean, there, there was some concerns when, uh, when we got that turnout, um, and I think that's a fair criticism, but I don't think we should sort of self-destruct on this either. Um, and I think that's important. So I don't want anybody who felt like they showed up for the first time and this was their first move in getting involved with the union and go, oh, well, that didn't really work, you know, screw it. Um, no, that's not it. It's just something, it, it's something that we, we, we build on and we learn from, um, and I hear you. I understand why people are frustrated. It's been an incredible couple of years. I think there's a lot at play here, but one of them is the fact that they are grinding us down to nothing. And I hope to God they hear. But also I wanna understand if somebody is going through these incredible sort of circumstances, we should also address it on our own as much as we possibly can and learn those skills as well. Um, and stop working against each other. But Kevin, I hear you. Um, let's, you know, look, we just got, it's, it's only been since Saturday. We're getting the message out. We're getting the details out. So I hope everybody can take the time, really comb over it. If they've got questions, they should reach out to us and really evaluate this. I, I know there's an emotional response to it. Uh, and it, and, and it, it was a mixed bag. I mean, I've been hearing both sides of this, right? I've been hearing you know, thank you, there's an elation, what a relief, and then also, you know, this is crap, whatever, and so um, I think we're just going to have to deal with that. I know that, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Corey, uh, name of craft? 
Hi, right, Corey Christensen, uh, Prop Maker. How's it going, guys? Good. Um, I appreciate everything you guys have been doing. Uh, been following it, you know, pretty closely. Um, I just got to say, you know, I'm impressed that, uh, you know, you rallied a, a strike authorization um, internationally and uh, we didn't have to go on strike. And we've got, you know, more than your rebuttal to their offer um, from where I stand. Um, and I think we're doing pretty good in the general market, you know, of the world as it is. Um, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you, Corey. Um, my concern, and uh, I'm sure plenty of people in this changing world is um, uh, mandates. And my question would be, is there any verbiage in this contract that's gonna leverage um, our employment with uh, medical procedures such as vaccinations? And if that issue were to come up, uh, would you be you know, willing to back the membership in their personal medical decisions? Um, there's nothing in this agreement that deals with um, the return to work or COVID related issues, or that's a, a separate return to work. Um, and I'm not, I'm not washing my hands of this position, but this agreement, the return to work agreement was negotiated with, uh, with the IA, SAG, DGA, Teamsters, and, and Basic Crafts. And it was very clear from President Loeb in the very beginning that he believes that, uh, that people should get vaccinated at the job site. So, I'll, you know, our position here is to serve the agreements. I agree with them, honestly. And I understand that this is a very divisive issue and we've had some shows that have put on full mandates. And I just hope that we can get past this where we're not talking about this anymore, um, to be honest. But where it stands right now, we're here to serve those agreements. Um, that agreement expires at in 11 days or 12 days. I don't know what the future of it is. There's a phase two to that agreement, if you're familiar with it. I don't think anybody's implemented the phase two and I'm not sure where we're at with the RMOT number. I think we were there for a while, but again, that's a sort of a pullback. Um, but when it comes to the A zone, for sure, that's a vaccination zone. And, um, you know, if Corey, if you're, you're, you're in the prop maker and you don't want to go that direction, I think we can find a place, uh, there's going to be a place for you. This hasn't really gone very far beyond the A zone people, with the exception of a couple of shows, and even some facilities have had I've kind of pumped the brakes on it as well. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that, you know, I understand, you know, very complex situation, yeah. another very divisive thing. Um, as long as you'll work with us, you know, we have a place, you know, that's fine. Um, you know, the, the medical indoctrination, you know, not from my physician, you know, that's why we have health insurance, pay my doctor with my medical exemption from my military experiences. Um, you know, it feels very discriminatory. And I would hope that you guys understand that a lot of our membership feels that way and uh, you can defend us. So All right, Corey, I'm going to try to keep it on topic from here on out. Okay. Thank you, Natalie uh, Craft, a uh, name and craft. Go ahead, Natalie, you're still muted. Uh, Jennifer Name and Craft. Uh, Jennifer Chauvin, prop maker. Um, so my question has to do with this um, regressive bargaining thing that's been touted um, by the IA, by 44. Uh, David's posted it on a few threads online. Um, it's pretty narrowly defined. Like we've been talking to or trying to like read NLRA things and talking to labor lawyers. And it basically, from what I understand, is that uh, it's is it? um, it's not regressive bargaining to increase a proposal after a change in conditions, which would include a strike authorization vote, and that it's typically like directed at employers, where um, making a proposal on a contract negotiation which offers less than the party's previous proposal is not per se bad faith 
successively less generous offers when made without reasonable justification and without significant tor- significant compensate compensatory proposals may indicate an intention not to reach an agreement. So I don't understand where this is coming from, where we can't go back to the table and say 5%, even though it's, I, I understand that we started at 5%, but it seems like unless it's a pattern of regressive, of regressive positions. Right, so, so here's just so the thing is, is it can go both ways, right? So, you know, a filing of a ULP, you know, is often a threat, but if, if one side starts to regressive bargain, then it's a tit for tat. And so they start regressive bargaining. And the problem is now you're not building on anything going forward. So but to say we can't make proposals versus it's tricky seems like dishonest language. No, I, well, I, I mean, look, we've had, I mean, between the two rooms, there was probably two dozen lawyers and we got called out on some stuff that could have been progressive, uh, regressive and they were called out. The problem is it's what's good faith bargaining, right? Are we gonna, if, if we go to that point, again, they can really counter our offers with regressive bargaining as well, or what could be perceived as uh, progressive bargaining. I'm not a lawyer, um, you know, it, it is a kind of a, a nuanced thing. And you're right, the, the, there's not necessarily a huge penalty, but if, if either the management or the labor side really want to throw a wrench into the works, they can. So there is there is the rules and you kind of honor the rules and um, and, and, and that's so. Right, but a strike authorization vote with the 98.6% voting in favor does present a change in circumstance where you could say, you know, because I know it's like we proposed this raise and they propose zero. So when you're like 5% versus zero, I understand that that's a really hard place to start because they're like, no, we're putting the bar on the floor. But when the membership says like, we need better working conditions, we're dying and crashing our cars and you know, these, so, and, and like to that point, the whole turnaround, like the weekend turnaround, it's 54 if it's five days, 32 if it's six days, and then still just 10 if it's seventh day. So like that doesn't address a lot, like, you know, the reasonable rest, the sustainable benefits, our main points that we agreed on to negotiate as a 13 group. Right, and I think, look, in those circumstances, that's what we talked about. We need to make accommodations. It wasn't that long ago when I was an assistant business agent, people would get mad because they didn't get the sixth or seventh day call. Right. And because they've completed a 40 hour work week, a five day work schedule. And they would say, well, why did I get cut out of that work? And it's like, well, they, within the agreement, they could. And I right. think what's happened is we've we, we've we've stopped being able to manage that, like what's important and prioritize it. And I think for now, the first time people are starting to prioritize it. So I would I would really implore if you're a department head, if you're a, a boss, whatever, anything like that, pay attention the welfare your crew should be number one. And I learned that early on. I don't, you know, I don't really remember the shows I worked on, but I remember the people and the welfare of that crew should be number one. And so if you're going weekend to weekend to weekend, and nobody's getting a, a break. And I know it's like, oh, I don't want, you know, I don't want to lose this opportunity. We got to start saying, you know what? No, you need to take a proper rest. And we can kind of handle this. We can we can start ad, uh, addressing this in a creative way to make sure that our core crew or anybody doesn't do uh, weekend after weekend after weekend or long hours and long hours, right? We can start making accommodations and just say, hey, to the UPM, I, look, I, I don't want this person to work. We need a break. What, what can we do? We need to start advocating for ourselves. And we need that... If we do, we need to get the support of our department heads behind it. And I think that's a conversation we should start having because we can do a lot culturally to turn this tide. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Natalie, uh, name of craft. She may not know that her hand's up. Ashley, next one. Uh, Shella, name of craft. Shelly, you're muted.
now? Hello, hello. There you go. You're coming through loud and clear. Okay, great. Hi. Sorry about that. Sure. Um, so, uh, building on Teresa's comments, the DGA, the WGA, and SAG all made significant gains with streaming residuals, streaming monies in their last rounds of negotiations. Why aren't we building off of that? Three years from now, God willing, there won't have been a worldwide pandemic shutdown. Right now, workers everywhere are standing up to unfair bosses. Is this really the best deal that we can get? We need a piece of what we created, the same as TV and film. Well, we do, right? But why aren't we all, going for it right now? When in all fairness, Chella, the way residuals work in, um, I'd say, above the line is that it's actually a part of their salary compensation. So actors, directors, and writers like royalties, right? There's an intellectual property that's attached to it so that that residual is a part of their, basically their salary or their compensation. Traditionally, our residuals have always been a secondary market and they've mm -hmm. been the, what helps us fund our plans. Yes. So it's not apples to apples. So I want everybody to be clear about that because I know that's been thrown our way a lot. So sure. it is different. Uh, I, I mean, it's a, a dollar is a dollar, but I don't, you know, I don't think we're done here. And I, and I agree there, there might, there might be a way or there might be a time where those streaming services are, you know, basically self-contained and they don't really pop, you know, produce anything, but we're still getting a significant amount of streaming and secondary markets. And we live to fight another day, right? I, this is not over. I mean, I know that it's a priority. If but, I could please finish. Yeah, sure. If TV and film were getting 9%, why didn't we at least go for that 9% with our, from our 5.4%? 9%. from TV and box office, and we get 5.4% from streaming, according to the a PowerPoint a few times ago. So why wouldn't we try to achieve parity at least, at least? We, we did, we had an entire, uh, streaming residual proposal that was very detailed. Um, you know, the problem with any bargaining session is that you have to get the other side to be interested or incentivizing, incentivized in um, agreeing to something. And there are a number of things on the table and you have to prioritize. And this was part of the strike authorization vote. It was a big tenant of it, the sustainable benefits portion. Right. And and, right. and, I, and I, if we're sustain, sustained, no, part of, part of sustained, by David. And to answer your question, you said that to a member on Facebook in a comment, and an eboard member did see your comment. Uh, okay, I mean, I'm I'm not saying I did. I'm just you you say which which comment are you talking about? Are you talking about the the thing she that, that Alicia brought up? That if they vote no, they're going to get what they deserve. Yeah, get what they deserve. It was real snarky and mean, but that's not my thing. Okay, my thing and, is we okay so just, just you brought it up. I'm happy to address it. We okay. need a piece of streaming content. This is the time. We will never, ever have another strike authorization vote again. Never in our careers. This is the time, guys. Yeah. I, again, I don't know what crystal ball you've got, but... Um, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's over. 24 I mean, years, Toby. We haven't had streaming for 24 years. No, I've been working in this industry for 24 years. I know the culture. I know what we've been doing. Listen, I appreciate that it was really hard to get to where we are. I get it. I know. I'm with you. But this streaming thing that we did not achieve streaming residuals and you threw in the towel on Saturday afternoon is so insane. that's so wrong. We we it's push this as far as we possibly can. And I and I, and I look, I everybody should recognize that you do not you're not gonna get everything. We knew we had some core priorities. And we knew that we weren't gonna get them all. All right. And so, but we got a significant amount of them and we've addressed some issues like you know the 54 hour turnaround the meal penalties these are going to address some serious issues so that is a significant win um it's just the way bargaining works you're not going to get everything you're going to get and again it's striking that balance it's like how far do you push and i will say i was far more uncomfortable 
but we pushed, I think, as far, and I don't think we left much on the table. They funded, they still opened up the, the checkbook, and they still wrote us a check. So I understand that, but there were other priorities. And in that room between the 13 locals, we had to make some decisions. Um, and again, it was, we, we stuck together, we agreed on that, and we moved forward. Uh, Robert, uh, name of craft. Robbie Dean, construction coordinator. Did you hear me? Yeah, thank you, Robbie. Good to see you, man. So the question I had is the, um, the rest period, is that for on production and off production, like the yeah. sixth and seventh day? Yeah. So if you work six days, how much for rest period do you need? 32 uh, before 32. you return to work. Yeah. And what about seven days? 10 hours. 10 hours. Okay. So that deals with both because I know there was some confusion with some of the guys about that. Yeah. All right. That's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks a lot. Take care, man. Uh, Lee, Lee uh, name of craft. Lee Sforza, prop maker since 1979. I understand the retirees that retired before 2009 have a 13th and 14th check. How about the rest of us that have retired in the last 11 years? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to let our contract expert Dave. But so there is the, the 13th and 14th check has to be bargained every agreement. But there is a provision now that addresses the uh, look back and the 10% uh, increase. Uh, if we maintain a certain level of, res not residuals, but a certain level of uh, months in reserves. Uh, David, can you get... Uh, yeah, in 2009, the formula for, for funding the pension was changed. Um, and in order to make it equitable to those re retirees who had pr retired prior to 2009 and to the people going forward, the idea of the 13th and 14th check um, was devised so that they would basically get a, whatever it is, a 17% uh, increase as well. And so that applies only to the people who retired prior to 2009. Um, there was an amortization schedule for funding it that was calculated at the time and gets factored in uh, every three years in bargaining. Um, and, but basically all the active members from that time forward are on the new system. Um, and one of the things that was negotiated in a previous uh, session was that every three years, there would be a 10% increase in the calculation figure that determines, that multiplies how many hours you have when you retire to basically incorporate a 3.33% um, cost of living increase into the pension. That was another thing on September 20th when Matt Loeb called the strike vote um, that was being rejected by the opposition. How come I didn't receive a increase at the end of this contract? Uh, so I'm sorry, you're already retired, correct? Yes. Okay, and you're and you re you get the 13th and 14th check? No, I retired five years ago. Okay, so whenever anyone retires, um, that their retirement amount is set. But while we're active members, the rate at which we will retire is increased by 10% every three years. If, so I will never see an increase? Not if you've already retired, nor will I when I retire. But up until that point, the amount that will calculate my retirement will increase by 10% every three years, unless... Yeah the employers stand firm and revoke that. This new, uh, let them. I'm sorry, in the in new contract, is our funding gonna go up to 100% at the end of this contract? Rather no, not at the end of the contract Canada? because the the funding of the pension um, is, is like um, paying the mortgage on a home. For the pension to be 100% funded, that would mean that if all income stopped in the film industry, if, if 
all current past revenue streams stopped, that every single person uh, would receive their full pension. And because we have thousands of employers that contr contribute to the pension, and because um, if there was a cataclysmic event that stopped the income streams coming into those multi-employers, that would we'd be dealing with bigger problems and whether or not we were getting a pension. Um, that is something, the fully funding of the pension is not something that's practical. Um, in other words, it's just like when you, when you are, are paying off your mortgage and you get close to paying it off, you've got a lot of equity in your house and you may decide that you want to remodel your bathroom. So you take some of that equity out and you invest it in the bathroom. And it's just like um, that with the 10% increase that we keep adding a little more to the total down the, the line, but at the same time, we're continuing to pay in. And if you've noticed, it incrementally is being raised. And if we get close to 85%, 95%, it, it's my hope that we will then be able to negotiate pension increases for people who have already retired because one of the problems that we're having, one of the reasons our pension is, the cost of our pension is going up is because thankfully all of our pensioners are living longer and require a longer payout. And so it's one of my hopes that we'll be able to negotiate a pension increase at a certain point for people who have already retired and are having the good fortune to live a long life. Thank you, Lee. Brandon, I'm going to kind of get this rolling a little bit better. Uh, Brandon Amacroft? Uh, Brandon McLaughlin, Special Effects Coordinator. Um, so uh, I've been through nine of these. I've been in for a while. Um, and every time that I think that we, that, that we negotiate and we come back with an agreement, I feel like we come up to standard. We never get anything that's above standard. We always come up. We're always fighting for something to, to come up to where, you know, where we should be being, we should be paid for what we're actually doing. We work twice as much as the average human being. And, and I'm sorry, but streaming is a huge part of what I'm looking at in the next 10 years. We need to start, we need to go back to the negotiating table. I'm going to vote no. That's all I need to say. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, next, Ashley. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, yeah Matthew Brenner, prop maker. Uh, just a couple of things um, uh, before I ask my question. Uh, Toby, you said that we better go on strike when they come after our pension, um, but I think that that's uh, almost like ridiculous to say because uh, they are coming after our pensions by not having to pay into them. I'm obviously re uh, referring to streaming services, not having to pay into our pension and benefits. Um, so my, my question is, um, when we uh, voted on the strike authorization, this was a big point that you guys had brought up and said, uh, you know, that you guys were fighting hard for. And like, I, I also want to say, I appreciate all the things that you guys have done. Did you guys use that as leverage in order to get all of the things that we did get in this uh, basic agreement? Essentially, did you guys say, okay, you know what, we're just not going to make you guys all pay uh, uh, into our pension health care? Um, so that we can get all this other stuff. Um, Matt, Matthew, so they, they did pay into the pension. You know, they, they, their, the projection was um, 371 million, I think, technically. So what we did was we got the money to serve that, um, to serve that shortfall or that projection. And the way we got it was they, increase the hourly contributions of the employers to the plans. So we served, we served it. Um, and so they were willing to make, to make those contributions. It may have not been the ideal, but we've, we met that goal. And actually in the time that it took us for the bargain, that number had actually significantly even increased or decreased rather because the hours were continuing to go on and we're, we're really in a, in, in, a, in a time where a lot of production's happening. So we saw that number actually decreased over the time that we were uh, bargaining, it, bargaining it. So we, we served the pension and health and we've seen it grow on projected uh, in the 15 year plan. Um, so we got what we needed. Now, 
of those of those other areas, maybe that became a less of a priority. But these other areas were more of a priority. It was the, maybe the working conditions and, and things like uh, the, the meals and the turnaround. So we still got mm -hmm. everything we needed there. It yeah, just was I, different. I, I, you know? I guess, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I guess everybody's priorities are different. And obviously that's why yeah. we're in, uh, you, you know, we all have the ability to vote on this. Um, you know, my vote's going to be no. And, uh, you know, I hope everybody else does the same. And I hope we get back to uh, uh, the table and, and come up with something better. I really appreciate your guys' time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, name and craft. Hey, Stephen Schley, uh, property. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, one uh, comment and then a question that is one and a half parts. Um, you talk, we've been talking a lot about the change in culture and I'm 100% on board with all of that. You know, our crews fight really hard. You do not open the truck until call time, uh, whether that's pre-call or crew call, doesn't matter. You, um, you know, those general kind of points, but I think a little bit of some of the frustration has come that because we need to see a little bit of a change in culture from leadership, whether that's IOTC, 44, whoever, because, you know, points that have been raised, calling this a Hollywood ending, calling this a landmark agreement. I think that's a bit of a stretch because people were really hoping for the true home run. And like you said, you can't get everything the first time and that's understandable. So you know, that kind of language, I know from me seeing in articles from MSNBC, Variety, uh, all these people who talk to us, calling it Hollywood, Landmark, et cetera. Well, actually, it's a start. And I think it would help if we saw a little bit of a change in language. Um, yeah, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you're in a moment and we have been grinding on this agreement uh, for a very long time. So... You know, I, I think a, pe a lot of people might be making a lot more out of that that's necessary because I think, again, it's that ire. But you know what? We, we stuck together and through the leadership of President Loeb and Vice President uh, Miller, we really did deliver a blow to the AMPTP that hasn't been seen. Now, was it, it, did it live up to everybody's expectations? We knew that expectations were probably going to be too elevated, but we'd already been bargaining that agreement for three and a half months when we went for the strike authorization. They called it on, they called us out on it. And, 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 I, and I understand that sort of, oh, you know, this is a, a moment. But again, I don't want people to get discouraged by this. No, and that's, and that's not what I'm saying. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that a lot wasn't achieved, but like you've been saying, assuming if, if and when this passes, it's something to build on and seeing more of that language coming from leadership saying, we know we didn't get everything, but we need to stay together because what I'm really afraid of yeah. is that in three years, we will have lost this momentum. We'll have lost, you know, yeah. and, and so just trying, how can we stay together? What language right. can we use to maintain Steve, that unity? Steven, yeah. what, when did you get, when did you uh, uh, join? When were you obligated? Uh, 2017. Okay. And the reason I ask is I, one when we were in our in our group, you know, we we talked about like so. I think I was obligated in '97, um, you know, and I and I saw that there was a lot of division amongst the Hollywood locals. Uh, there was the back lot, and there was you know there there was a lot of drama. Uh, and I know Anthony could probably give you blow to blow by blow by blow detail on that. And you know, from and even when I got involved with the local. As, a, uh, as an executive board rep, you saw it. You, you saw it at Local 44. You saw it with the other locals as well. Um, and even when I was became an assistant business agent, there was, you know, oh, those guys or those guys. Uh, you know what was remarkable in this whole process, and I've said it before, it's just, you know, we've come together. And I, I don't, and I mean it, I don't think we'll ever bargain this agreement the same way again. And, and, that's, and that's good. That's good for us good for the industry it's good for our people um and uh so that's a silver lining I, I you know again i stand by this agreement i think it's a good agreement but um but that's also something that i don't think a lot of our members may recognize the fact that we came together and we're we're stronger now than ever and i just hope we can get this thing ratified and we don't and we can move on and move forward and i'm willing to have those conversations i know on calls got a lot of issues 
I've talked to some of the other on-call locals about this, about the culture, what we can do. So, you know, I'm all for getting involved and uh, with those, other, you know, whether it's a committee or a coalition of 44 to, to, to have those conversations with 800, with um, 892, there's, there's on-calls in all the locals to some extent, but I think there's a position between our on-calls, there's a relationship between our on-calls 800s on calls and uh, costumers guilds on calls. And I think we should start working uh, uh, to address those issues because they're not universal, but they're very similar. And again, I think that's something we should probably start sooner than later. Thank you, Stephen. Stephen. Uh, Christopher Name and Craft. Uh, yeah, Christopher Hansen, uh, property master. Hey, guys. So I want to start off saying I appreciate everything you're doing. I know it's a hard process and it's harder with 60,000 people, not just you guys, but 60,000 members with 60,000 opinions yelling at you. So um, I'll start by saying, I agree that you're saying we need systemic change in this business. We're not like our members aren't getting dropped off on an oil rig doing three weeks on three weeks off. Yeah. We're not working in emergency rooms. We're pointing cameras at people and filming like the, we are i feel like culturally when i started in the business and i've been in for seven years i've been in the union since 2015 i there there wasn't a sense of defeat but when i got in i felt like we were recovering from runaway production and the fallout from the writer's strike and the focus of the union was we're not going to poke the bear because the bear will rip our face off again well, now at this moment, I feel like we're like, well, where, where are they going to go? And so I, I get where you guys are coming from. So I just want to, I, to reiterate what you're saying, we can't lose this momentum. In three years, I would, I would hope that we have a more bullish union going forward. I hope this told leadership, look, 96% of your workforce was willing to walk off their jobs with you. So next, un next, next contract negotiation, we start higher than what we started with here and say, hey, look, do you want another strike authorization vote? It ain't going to take five months this time. It's going to happen a lot sooner. And yeah. maybe that's a, that's a, a bat that we carry in. And, and, and we use that to, you know, yeah. they've, been, they've been beating on us since the year I was born. You know, I always hear about the 87 agreement. I'm sorry to put it that way, but, you know, I hear about all the things we lost in 87. Well, you know, that was the year I was born. So that was 34 years ago. Let's, let's put that to bed and come out and start talking about like, you know, 21st century, you know, let, let's yeah. not let them keep kind of treating us like we are knuckle draggers and don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and real quick question for you. Um, pull up my note here sorry um okay so as far as the three percent goes i know this is your favorite thing but um second favorite thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's based on on pattern bargaining with the G dga correct mm -hmm. but yeah, typically i guess why is that because they're in my opinion, they they already all, they get a lot more sweetheart points, and part of that has to do with their membership. Is you know their pool is poisoned. Their their membership is made up a lot of people who are above the lines and negotiating with themselves. Of course, they're gonna give themselves their better perks, but we don't. Those perks don't always come across to us. So we're we're sort of pattern bargaining. We're not pattern bargaining in in. Uh, one to one, you know, we're pattern bargaining certain points yeah. that they they can they can go low on because they're getting getting it somewhere else. Um, so I'll be gonna let our 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 uh, SAG member uh, address that because again, it's 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 difficult because their their medical you know has been um, in in bad. I don't know all the details, but I know that's it's. So crisis mode, or they're trying to get out of crisis mode. Lots of heart attacks, I bet. But go ahead. You know, try, me, measuring our agreements against SAG or the DGA or the WG, WGA is 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 truly measuring an apple against an orange. They're just structured entirely differently. Um, there's huge amounts of unemployment in those memberships, um, 
and they are uh, uh, creative um, crafts which um, get intellectual property payments and as residuals. Um, and it's, it's just totally different. To your, to your question about the 3%, um, if you look at the uh, consumer price index for Los Angeles over 10 years, it averages out to 2.54%. Um, so we've stayed ahead of that. And yes, uh, currently, I believe that uh, because of the supply chain issues that we're at an inflation rate of, you know, 5%, but conversely, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we were at below 1%. Um, because of COVID-19. And the suggestion has been, well, why don't we tie our wage increase to the, um, the CPI or something like that? But, I, but frankly, um, we've done a little better than the Los Angeles CPI. And, you know, we can debate about whether that's an accurate measurement. Um, there are, you know, entire, uh, you know, graduate studies done on that and so forth. But right now, it's really the mainstream measurement for inflation in the United States. And, you know, you mentioned that 87 contract, but back in the the 70s and 80s, when I started in this business, um, inflation was 10, 12% a year. Um, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't talk about getting a loan unless you were paying 10% interest on it for a car or a credit card or, or a house. Um, so things have changed drastically since then. And, you know, again, back in the early 80s, um, I was a 25-year-old construction coordinator who had a lot of middle-aged, pissed-off um, prop makers working for me because the union wasn't willing to negotiate budget-based uh, rate tiers. And 50% or more of the work that was being done in Los Angeles was non-union. Um, and there were huge movies that were done non-union, True Lies. I mean, anything pretty much with James Cameron prior to, I believe it was um, uh, Titanic, was done non-union. And, um, and the 1987 agreements changed that. Tom Short changed that. And I know, I'm, you know, I know a lot of people disagree with me, but I'd much rather have someone working on a lower rate show, especially those newer members or those members that have had a hard time and need to get hours or whatever it is, and be working on a lower rate show and getting hours into their pension, getting hours into their health care, than working non-union and not getting any union benefits. Thank you, uh, uh, Christopher. Uh, uh, John, uh, name of craft. Hey, uh, John Sperano, set decorator. Um, just for all the set de decorators out there, I work on a flat, okay? And I know that contract, I don't know why that's never um, sort of addressed, but why, I mean, I, I know kind of how it happened, but yeah. I don't understand why it's still there, why that's never um, addressed. So that was my first question. So if you could talk to that, and then I have something to say after that. Oh. Uh why, why, I mean, as far as the structure as being as, as on call versus an hourly. Oh, we do yeah. want me to jump in. Sure. So John, um, sorry for the echo. We're upstairs in the assembly room. Um, John, since I've been at the local for almost two years now, understanding and researching the on call has been a top priority, but you heard me correctly. It's been something I've worked on for two years. Um, it's a complicated situation as to why you all are on call and not hourly. It has to tie into you being a manager. It has to tie with you being a department head. And as we all know, there was a time it was a great deal. It is no longer a great deal. It's only a great deal for the producer and that needs to be adjusted. Scheduling, timing, staffing needs to adjust with that. We are to the point now to we have sought counsel to discuss this issue. This is different for every local um, but ultimately the point of all of this and with the on call is we need to get you all to stop working yourselves to death and being forced to work yourselves to death i get that but i'm not gonna like take the responsibility of that on myself because absolutely not john 100 no. percent. Uh, and, here, no. and, and here, here's the other thing so that makes me uh, a very contract oriented person so when i see the streaming, you know, the streaming uh, wages go up like by nothing, basically, for me. 
that becomes a thing with me. I'm like, why is that still like at $3,000? And it's just like, it, it's kind of ridiculous that it's still low like that when yeah. I'm on flat. Okay, so that's my first thing. And the next thing is, um, I, I just, I mean, I, we have to, I'm just going to say, say this, I'm voting yes on this contract because there is simply no other choice because we have to. And unfortunately, we have to. And I, I don't want to explain that any, any more than that. We're backed into this corner. We have to vote yes, because if we don't, we will lose everything. We'll, get, we'll go on strike. We'll be locked out till March. And I don't want to see it. But I would love to see a different kind of strategy in three years from now. I know you guys work yeah. your ass off. I, I love all you guys. Thank but you. I think there's a 21st century strategy that has to be worked with these guys. And I don't know what that is. I don't know how we get it. But I think it's got to change. All right. Hey, John, are you getting involved with the, uh, the set decorators group? No, and that's on me, and I should. And I, yeah, because I, you know, I look, I that hasn't been in place for very long. Uh, but that's exactly the kind of like internal organizing that we're going to need to sort of turn the, the tide on these issues. And, 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 and now's a good time because it, it's busy and, you know, we got to stick together on some of these issues in better terms. And I think, I, I don't know all the details and I think I, I would really, uh, and, and I'll, I'll ask Andrea Joel or, uh, you know, um, our, our set deck reps to reach out to you and maybe the set deck steering committee to sort of kind of show you where it's, it's helping and it's working. Um, but I think it's that sort of working together on these issues and not sort of working against each other on these issues, I think is where a part of that success is going to be. Uh, and it, again, it gets into that cultural thing. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? We're, we're freelance industry under a, a trade unionism uh, banner and, and it was kind of counterintuitive. And so I think instead of competing with each other, I think there's, you know, safety in numbers. And so I'll, I'll make sure that uh, somebody from the, either the committee or the, the reps reach out to you. Yeah, and working you, outside the call is nothing any of us want to do. I mean, believe yeah. me, that decker I know does not want to work outside the call. But yeah. here, here's the thing. At the end of the day, when you get 19 notes that have, and this is yeah. the producers, you get 19 yeah. notes that have all this stuff that has to show up by 7 o'clock tomorrow, you'll see me and 10 other decorators at Warner and Uni at 6 a.m. pulling everything we can. I've so seen them at, I've seen them at Target at 1030. Yes. You know? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Issues. So, I mean... But like I said, I don't know. I don't know what that solution is, but I would love to find it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I get involved. I really, that's what it's about. Getting involved with that group, and uh, I'll make sure somebody connects with you, John. I, we'd love to have you a part of it. And cool, again, thank again, you. The safety in numbers. Uh, Michael McCraft. <clears throat> Michael, uh, can you hear us? Bring the next one in at Ashley. Okay, Hello. Michael. Name it, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Uh, Michael uh, Property. Hey, um, my question is um, one thing about how do we ensure that the timing that synchronizes on all the 13 unions having the um, impact that we've had this time around? Does that happen every contract, every three years, automatically resets to where we're all lined up? No, it'll go back to the original date. Um, and I mean, it, it doesn't always have to, but, you know, sometimes. I heard that to happen. I mean, that's, that's yeah. us having all 13 renew at the same time to where we're either all in or we're all out. I mean, yeah. I think, he's talking, I think he's talking about the Hollywood locals, uh, to uh, all 13 Hollywood locals that we all go in together. Not. Oh, yeah. Not this is, I think, the first time that we've gone in with this sort of, uh, hive mind approach to it like and it wasn't easy I mean we were bargaining with ourselves trying to get the proposals that we did together it, that was a that was a huge process in its own and and interesting enough I mean the basic agreement would be bargain in a week or a two to three weeks um, and usually kind of earlier I know the last cycle there was an extension in place and it kind of got dragged out and there was retro back pay and um, but yeah this is a, I think you know we go in together. Uh, and I think President Loeb fostered that uh, right from at the very beginning that uh, he, you know, I don't know Tom Short well, but I, it was really much, 
you know, you were either on the ins or the outs. And, and Anthony, you can probably correct me on that. But um, I mean, he made sure that when everybody was in local negotiations, that everybody from the Hollywood 13 was in the room with the other locals and um, and and was a part of every step of every local's negotiations, independent negotiations. And then after that, we would go into collective bargaining uh, as a group over the MPI and stuff. And I think Matt was really the first one to like open up the room so that we had an equal number of people on our side that we did on the other side. Because there's about 60 lawyers on the other side. And labor of course, people. Yeah. Of course. and yeah. they're all getting paid. So yeah. I'm just saying, well, how do you ensure that we have this kind of solidarity three years from now. And you're saying we're gonna we're gonna build from what we've accomplished this time. Yeah. Well, how do we ha- how do we guarantee for each successive contract that we're going to be able to line up all of our strengths together at the same time? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, because we're not gonna have a COVID pandemic that sort of shaped this in a virtual setting, right? But well, here we are. Well, here yeah, we are right. <clears throat> but hopefully we're not here in three years. So I think, um, look, I, the thing is, we came out of this uh, stronger than ever and uh, armed, you know, you know, together on. And so there's no division. There's no, you know, and, and we've seen what's happened in the past cycles. And, you know, there's been people that felt left out or did not uh, agree. But uh, we all confidently uh, ratified, uh, you know, got behind this agreement and, so it's there. I think we just need to continue the communication and foster it. Uh, and I, I have every intention to do that. Just to what I spoke about um, the other, the other, um, other locals. Like there's more. We have a lot more in common, and we should really be starting to think that way when we come to the producer. So that when 800 and uh, 8, 892, they're bargaining over the same issues that 44 uh, and maybe 700 are. Uh, right. and that's yeah. These, right. are three, these are three-year deals. Why would they not renew with, you know, at the same time? They're all being uh, ratified at the same time. Would they not all renew exactly? They would. That would set up a synchronicity from here on out? Or is there obviously going to be some way that they can stagger them to where they come out of synchronicity for future contract negotiations forthcoming? Yeah, if you're talking about the area standard and the basic agreement, we're not that far off of uh, the mark there. Um, and so, but if you're talking about the Hollywood locals, we are all on the same uh, cycle, all on the same basic agreement. Our individual agreements also are on the same cycle. From here on out. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know about the area standard. I, they're bargaining that right now. And, and to be honest, I don't know where they're at. I know they had a lot of very similar proposals and issues as well. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure. 100 percent sure we're talking about the same thing. Give but, me a call uh, tomorrow. I, I don't yeah. actually, yeah. but I, uh, I, I got a lot of people in the queue. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Ella, Ellen, name and craft. Uh, my name is Ellen Nielsen, and I'm a local 44 set dresser. Um, I am seeing uh, basically cross craft solidarity against this contract. Yeah. Um, yeah. It feels like uh, we're, we basically functionally have the same meal penalties we've always been getting because I've never had more than four. Um, there's no residuals from self-distributed streaming media. Um, our raises aren't commensurate with inflation. And uh, frankly, I just, I feel like this is the time now. Um, there's, as it's been mentioned before, a, a nationwide labor movement happening. Um, we have huge public support. Um, the, that's just my comments on this. I'm obviously going to vote no. Um, but I have a question about the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiative that hasn't been addressed at all. Everything that I've been hearing about it is um, incredibly vague. So I'd like some hard information on that. And I'd also like um, hard information about, uh, I think actually, Toby, you uh, addressed this earlier, the process moving forward at this point, kind of the different things that could happen. But if you could, I guess my, the final question is actually a request for that to be put in writing in an email to us all, not just explained casually in a- The D- uh, DEI or the, uh, yeah, so there is a but, statement that's gonna come out, I think it's tomorrow, uh, regarding the, the, 
the possibilities of a, a an authorization versus a a non authorization. I, and I I think that's scheduled uh, to go out tomorrow, or in the next day or two. So I can't say for sure. Um, there's a lot that I need to catch up, but we got the the three PDFs out that go into the details, and I think this is uh, right behind it. I'm sure I'm sure you're very. Uh slammed with things right now to do but it, yeah it would be great if we had an actual uh, like hard information about what the process is moving forward different things that could happen yeah Thank and you know what I'll, in the in the comms meeting I'll, i think we need to get a statement out on the dei i'll make that suggestion i'll be i'll be honest with you it's seven pages long uh at this point it's very complex it's very nuanced and it, that was so long ago. I don't. I'm not going to do it justice by speaking to it. So, let me see if we can get um, a write up on that, uh, also distributed, because we haven't been getting those questions as much, but they're they're relevant. So I appreciate that, Ellen. Uh, Lars uh, name it craft. Hi, this is Lars Flynn with Property. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, you went over that you guys would never go into the bargaining room the same way after our, you know, unprecedented vote. So my question is, is what is going to be the difference in your asking the next time around? And then also, if you could go back knowing what you know now about the level of solidarity, what would be the difference in your ask? Like, what would you have asked differently knowing now? because you guys obviously feel like you have quite a bit much more power um, yeah. against the producers. So yeah. what would that look like for our members? So I, I think um, as far as bargaining going forward, um, I think it's gonna be a more collective effort to develop proposals uh, together on these issues. And really, I think there's gonna be a lot more engage earlier. I, this this cycle was difficult because we were just getting slammed with one disaster return over all the issues that were coming up to this really sort of hampered uh, our approach but i think that you know we made it a concerted effort to forego local negotiations and concentrate on that so i think going forward i think there's going to be a lot more deliberate uh, uh process of building these proposals together as opposed to just bringing a bunch of proposals as an independent local and then throwing them in the pool and say, okay, who matches up with what? Because I think there's gonna to have to be a strategy necessarily too. So how do those proposals support each other as well? And you know, I think that there's some value in the fact that there's some locals that aren't gonna be as strong versus that some locals that are gonna be stronger. And so that needs to be taken into consideration too. So I think there's gonna be a lot more strategic um, planning with the proposal, uh, you know, uh, drafting, uh, and going to see where, uh, what we have in common and, and how we can uh, attack and approach and draft proposals uh, together as opposed to just doing them independently and then putting them into a bowl and then trying to figure out where, uh, what overlaps on those issues. So, um, yeah, I think, I think there's been uh, just a, a coalition. I think there's just a, a a brother in arms sort of situation after what we've just uh, hammered out over the last uh, six months. And then what would we change? Um, <laughs> um, well, if I could just jump in, yeah. you know, in March, we sent a survey out to all 6,000 members, I'm rounding up, and um, asking what you know, it was a number of questions about what you wanted us to fight for in the negotiations. And um, we got 483 responses, I think. Um, again, you know, look for that in three years when we're asking and, and you know, maybe we, we need to create more fanfare around it and, and uh, uh, put more promotion to it. But um, we are looking for input from the members. Um, you know, what we were told in that survey was that the most important things were maintaining wages and maintaining health and pension care. Um, and that those were the issues that we were told 
members were willing to strike over, if their wages were diminished or if their benefits were taken away. Um, and in spite of that, with the other 13 locals, we also, um, you know, did make all these proposals for the on-call extra hours, for the meal penalties, for the weekend turnarounds, for all of these things that are in this agreement. And, um, you know, I know that it's frustrating, but uh, uh, I think, you know, again, to look at the fact that we made all these demands of the of the producer, um, they basically said, sorry, um, we're, we're just not incentivized to give you what you believe you need. And then the membership rallied behind us and said, oh no, you didn't. And the next thing they says was, what are you doing tomorrow? And we come away from a contract where we basically have a 98% win record, except for the two items that Toby mentioned. Um, so I, I think everybody needs to, to retain a little bit of perspective on this and, um, and in three years, uh, help us with the things that are most important to you, uh, when we reach out and ask. Thank you, Lars. Uh, Tracy, Dynamic Craft. Tracy? Jesse, name of craft. Hey guys, uh, Jesse, I'm, I'm with uh, props. Um, I just had a quick question. Brass tax, what are we looking at for actually seeing this in writing and voting on it? So I think at best it's gonna be, so the MOAs have to be drafted and vetted by legal from both sides. I think we're really looking at three to four weeks before the electronic vote will go through. Uh, you'll get an MOA, uh, probably electronic and hard copy, Dan Anthony. I think that when we were doing the comms committee meeting, I think they're going to go back through the same process we used for the uh, with honest ballot, like we did for the strike authorization. So yeah, that's what's on the table right now, but it's not it's not finalized. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely, Tracy. Um, uh, name of craft. Uh, Ray, name it, Craft. Hi there. Hey. Uh, Ray Deslich, uh, Set Decorator Craft. Um, so my question goes back to seventh days. Um, the uh, I understand that the weekend, the increased weekend turnaround only applies to... Um, you know, if you work a five day week and then there's a smaller turnaround if you work a six day week. But um, this doesn't actually do anything to protect people from working sixth and seventh day weeks. And, um, you know, this normally doesn't apply to like people in off production turnarounds, but, you know, even as a set decorator, I've had to work a sixth day or had to work a seventh day. Uh, and at some point, the money is just not worth it, especially if you're doing them for consecutive weeks yeah. or you know, if the previous six or five days were already enough of a killer. Um, and so much of the push around this deal was about safety, about preserving life, about making sure that we're not like literally working ourselves to death. And six and seven days are one of the biggest issues around that. So what, if anything, in this proposed agreement protects us from working more and more sixth and seventh days? I, I would say it's really, and I, and I know this may not go down well, but I think, again, what we were talking about advocating for ourselves and what's safe and what we can, cannot achieve reasonably, <clears throat> and also sort of setting expectations, and again, if you're not going to get support, quite honestly, from your designer about this, that's a problem, right? And so we, we need them to support it, you know, and say, hey, that's just not, not reasonable. It's not safe. Um, I need a break. My crew needs a break. You know, I'm hoping that, you know, the, the, the same day dress, same day wrap thing uh, with the turnaround issues and stuff goes away or it gets, you know, 
we do yeah strike. or in like in Setek, it's usually it's like a weekend strike you know or sometimes okay. a weekend dress yeah and if if your core crew has just done that too much you know get another crew in there possibly and and, and it just get ahead of it as much as you possibly can and you know, I know I'm probably, I can probably, I can feel the eyes rolling right now, but <laughs> we have to, we have to, um, we have to have to think out of, like that. We have to think uh, about how we can do it. And well, another thing that we're currently struggling with is uh, because everyone's working, it's hard enough to find right, crew, crew just to stay crewed yeah. up. So like my show that I'm currently on, for instance, um, we were having trouble finding fill-ins to even work those yeah. uh sixth and seventh days you know so the option was like pull in like three permits to work by themselves on a saturday or work some of our core people to at least be with them yeah so that's not always an option and ever since i've been in the union the mo from the local has been you know organize yourself advocate for yourself but at some point this isn't like this is not a self-advocacy organization. This is a collective bargaining organization. So, you know, the bar has to be put somewhere. It's wild yeah, look, that there's I, I, no financial fair. disincentive for them to work us six or seventh days, aside from like the slight increase that has clearly proven not to be a disincentive already. Yeah. Yeah, with location fees and everything else involved, it's, you're right. Um, we have to make humans more expensive than equipment and places. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I hope the producers have learned. And I and I would like if if you get yourself, I know we're there's a, a show that we're dealing with right now that is just the their pre-production expectations and or what's being the expectations happening in pre-production going into production are just like, you know eye-opening like are you are you serious right so we're going to try to address that there there is a committee set up a part, part of this agreement you'll see it in the mo is that there is a labor management committee that is going to be uh organized and you know i know committees you know they sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't but you know i think we can push that to make sure that these sort of issues these excessive hours issues can be addressed um, and, um, you know, it, you're right. We're going to have to do better. We're going to, but I really do need to have some member involvement on it as well. And if, if you feel comfortable that we can step in and maybe have a conversation about this and not hear it at a, uh, at a meeting, uh, three months after it happened, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to give that a shot. I mean, it's, it's a drink, it's, it's hard on resources, but I think it, that's important, right? If we can get it, and if everybody's comfortable with us showing up and saying, "Hey, is this is this the way you should be doing this? Is this is this what how we want to continue it?" Um, but you're right. One, one of the frustrating things too is that we, you know, we have things in the agreement that our members don't benefit from, or don't aren't aware of, or or, or they don't take advantage of. And and you know, we know it's the people that don't put in their overtime, or they 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 skirt they they draft around a, a, or time card around a holiday or time card around a forced call, you know, to be on board. And that's, that's got to stop because we undermine the agreements and we've been in bad habit of doing that as well. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, it is, it's a real cultural issue. And I know we've talked about that and it's going to take a while, but I think the organizing that's happening with some of these crafts is really what's going to, it's really what we've been missing and what really what we're, going to, what we're going to need. Right. But I mean, it's, I, and I also believe in cultural change, but in terms of like That's goals right. stated in this agreement about, uh, you know, having sustainable work hours, what's, what's less sustainable than sixth and seventh days. Well, I don't know if that was, I mean, we've had sustainable mm -hmm. benefits. We've had, you know, reasonable rest. Or livable work hours, like whatever, you know, the yeah, keyword yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're you know, they're, I, we're going to have to start addressing this with, on our, on our we're, you know, we, on our own and being accountable for these issues as well. If we don't push back, if we say that's unreasonable and we keep 
rolling on it and we keep accommodating like we've done, like we've been built to do, you know, and that's what we're suffering from. We're, we're, we're too good at the job and we're, and we're too dedicated and we're, you know, we need to sort of start drawing limits of what we're, what will be acceptable or not. And if, if I may, we're actually somewhat right now a victim of our own success because we mobilize to get the tax incentives in California, in Los Angeles, that brought the work back to Los Angeles. And, you know, it coincided with the amazing streaming explosion. And it used to be that producers wouldn't let you work the weekend because they didn't want to pay the time and a half. They didn't want to pay the double time. But now, because we're in this gold rush mentality and we can't seem to make enough content, um, you know, there is the money hose that is, you know, being sprayed over everything. Um, and uh, it, is, it is both a blessing and a curse. All right, um, we're, 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 gonna, we're rounding up at 10 o'clock. I know there's still a lot of questions. Uh, let's get a few more, but I'm gonna wrap it up at 10. Uh, we've got David, Don Amacraft. Yeah, David Long, prop maker. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for your hard work. And um, I personally have been in for a long time and I saw this as a real point that the uh, union stood up. That's how I see it. And we, uh, the solidarity was um, pretty amazing. Out there, I'm hearing a lot of people claiming they're gonna vote no. And I was a little bit appalled on social media that it was, before they'd even heard anything about it, they were like getting, no, no, don't vote, no. Like this meeting was very good. I was res uh, re reserving and I am gonna vote yes. And I do have a question um, for those, members that are fortunate to be paying over, to be being paid over scale, will the retroactive 3%, will they be included in that? Only if it was a part of that. I mean, look, I think it's, it's worth making a, a, a grab for it, but technically uh, terms that are in better terms of condition, that needs to be spelled out. Um, so I, obviously the book rates, the rates that are apply in the agreement would be retro, but as far as um, uh, better terms and conditions, that would have to be, and I'd go for it, I would grab it. And if they want to keep that relationship uh, in good tact, you know, and hopefully they will accommodate, but it would have to be spelled out in your deal memo. So also just one point to that, anyone who is negotiating an above scale deal, rather than listing a dollar figure, make it 5, 10, 15, 25% above scale because then when the rates go up, so does your entire package. Got it. That's a good, that's a good point. Hey, thank you, David. Um, Steve, uh, name of Kraft. <clears throat> hey, Steve. Hi, uh, Paul, name of Kraft. <clears throat> Uh, Steve Namencraft. Hey, hey Tobe. Yeah. If they don't come, if they don't come back, I'm getting a boatload of text Steve, messages about me. the process. Steve's oh, on. Steve's on. Steve's on. I'll hold back. <laughs> um. Wow. Yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. It's been so long. Uh, no, I appreciate you guys. I was on the fence before this. I think uh, I think I'm in now. You've made your case. I appreciate it. Thank Strong you, work. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Hey, Paul, uh, um, name of craft. Um, Alex, name of craft. Yes, hello. Good, good, uh, good evening. Hey, Alex. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I feel like amongst the many, many things that need to be addressed from a membership standpoint because of the questions that are being asked and all of the confusion that this and many other issues need a way to there needs to be an education and there needs to be a source so we can go to you guys and get answers and get an idea of what's going to happen before it takes place because 
what usually happens uh, with this strike situation and situations like <clears throat> voting in presidents, voting out presidents, things like that, you get just a flurry of argumentative situations and no one's got, you know, very, there's very little factual information out there. So I think that something that would really help, and I hope it doesn't die in this conversation, is an education formulated by 44 for the members that helps everyone understand how these things work. And it gets to us before these things happen so that we all know how they work and what to expect. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. I think uh, somebody, uh, I think it was Lars that said, what would I do different? I think that's something I would do different. I would yeah. think, uh, yeah, you know. It would, it would relieve you guys of a lot of headache because people wouldn't yeah. be so, you know, irritated with the situation. I mean, yeah. I know for myself and that it felt like a, a long time between when the, uh, you know, we were told a deal was made and yeah. now, and it felt like a blackout. It was like a deal was made. Yay, we're all happy. There's people on NPR and things like that. Yeah. And we're all here going, what the hell is going on? What do you yeah. De Deadline even beat us, uh, beat us to uh, our announcement. And that, and that announcement was somewhat already pre-drafted. There was some details yeah. that had to be added to it. Yeah, everything's happened at the speed of light. And also, in those last days, things were moving so fast. And, and you, you want to make sure whatever you put out there is right. And we've seen what's happened with all the bad information that's gone there it's still pervasive and it, it just some of it was completely off the mark or misrepresentative right it leaks all over the place but yeah you know i you're right I, I mean we even got reports that we were done bargaining on friday night and we were still there for another hour and a half it was and, and the only the only people and the only group that can nip that in the butt is you guys yeah nobody yeah. else can give factual data than you guys and if you don't yeah. have that before the bomb hits yeah. Then you're dealing with an aftermath, rather than, you know. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm you're right. I, I think it's, it's been a struggle, uh, quite honestly, the communication with the, with the IA and, you know, and formulating all this stuff. And we've been working pretty diligently to get it. And I, you know, you're right. I think that's a, a totally fair criticism. Um, and, and to a company that I do know that, you know, based on what you guys are saying, that I wouldn't want to be stuck in a hotel with 20 lawyers myself so it, 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 it's obvious that you guys are up against a certain type of group so you know the, there's no doubt about that um but as far as education i think it would help you it would really help us i know for sure um if i could follow up on that i will but i would like to see something happen with that and not just have it be a comment at the end of a zoom meeting so there's that and then <clears throat> is there someone mentioned um, being able to compare as far as like an Excel spreadsheet, the old deal to the new deal. So we can actually see side by side what's changed and yeah. visually really understand it. So go to the website um, and you can go to, I mean, the agreements are there, but I love pushing this out, right? Uh, we have contracts at a glance, which are, it's a one sheet, it has the rates and it has about 10 to 15 of most common working conditions. And I think that's a good way to get, it's a good way to get familiar with the agreements mm -hmm. uh, and the differences and the nuances, but that might be a, a very good way to compare them. So you can take the current uh, basic agreement one sheet and then compare it to the documents that you got uh, emailed to you at 615. And you can kind of do the comparison there. It's called okay. contract at a glance. You can get it on the website. Copy that. Thank you All guys. Right. Thank you. All right, one more. Um, it, so, so can I just uh, spin real quick on the last point? I'm sorry, it, because of the communication point that the three of us were, were sitting in there. We were all shaking our heads, wondering where certain information was coming. Yeah. It appeared to be an employer tactic to reach out and start putting stuff in the press to make it look like a deal's done sooner than it actually is. Because we still had several passes of ghosts uh, when they started reporting that to pressure the other side. So that's part of that as well, where that was yeah. seen to be going on. So just. Good point. Also, one other comment I want to make, just so we're clear, we have a lot of lawyers on our side too. We're not in there just by ourselves. We have a bank of lawyers, some of them who have been through decades of negotiations. So 
Uh, that's that's a sort of rumor that's out there that, you know, why don't we have attorneys? Well, we, ab we absolutely do have attorneys on our side as well. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Phil Damoncroft. By Phil Stone, construction coordinator. Um, a couple of things. Um, based on some of the discussion earlier, the uh, it sounds like the 54 hours uh, off and the 32 hours, that means nothing. It's, that's, that should just be struck because it's 10 hours off, you know, off production. We can still work 112 hours a week and get 10 hours off and go back to straight time pay after our seventh day. That was something I wrote in about when I got the questionnaire. Second off, 3%. I understand you went and asked him for five. And I know I know a little bit about negotiations because my father was an arbitrator. So I know you guys were stuck by the time you got your strike authorization because you had already negotiated down to the point of what we have or not quite here. And if you negotiated lower once you had the strike authorization or gave them anything, that's a fail. That's an absolute fail on your part. Now you got some wins in the uh, pension and the funding of the healthcare, but we're gonna have to go through that again in three years, you know, cause we didn't get the streaming going forward. So, you know, you had a, a few little wins, a few little wins, but overall this contract is not a good one. 3% is not okay. It's not okay. The CPI we all know is crap. It doesn't include housing, food, or fuel. Nobody ever needs any of that. You know, I'm it really- on what CPI you're looking at. I mean, that's, that's a, un, also they, an unfortunate thing. Everybody is knows 5.4 so is a many... garbage number. Everybody knows it. We, they what? use that, but we all know that's garbage. What's... Inflation, you know, houses that cost 300,000 a few years ago are now 900,000 or a million dollars. You know that, you live in LA, Yeah. you know, so. I'm really disappointed and I'm going to have to vote no on this contract, you know, and, I, and, you know, I was really hoping for better. And what I'm really hoping for is that we vote no altogether so that you actually can go back and ask for more. Cause I know your hands are tied right now because that's part of good faith negotiating. And part of the problem is you guys are all good guys. You guys are all good guys. You're all decent men with, with a, a reasonable standard and you negotiate in good faith. The problem is you're good negotiating with people who don't. They don't. And they never have. The whole five of seven was an absolute ass screwing for everybody in our industry. Because now we're seven days a week on a regular basis and going back to straight time on day eight and going back to straight time on day 15 and going back to straight time on day 22. And that money hose that Dave was talking about, they're not spraying any of it in our direction. Reese Witherspoon got $900 million for her production company, $900 million. Netflix new show is projected to make $900 million. One third of one show would have paid our, the, the amount of money into the pension that we're bragging about. One third of one show on Netflix. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I wanna congratulate you on the hour increase for the, the, uh, the uh, on call because I'm on call and most of my life I've got 57 hours. You know, it just went up to 60 in the last contract. And so 70 is gonna be great for guys in the future, which I'm, um, congratulations on that. But going forward, as a union, we need to go in way higher. We're starting at, re we're starting at reasonable and getting screwed. Yeah. We to not be reasonable in our, in our requests because zero for increase for your rate, that's unreasonable. So if they're gonna be unreasonable, you gotta be unreasonable to start with. You know, I, I know you guys worked hard. I know it was a, a pain in the ass. And I know you got stuck when it came to the end and we had to take certain things because that's the way the NLR works. Yeah. You know? So thank you for the increases that we got. You know, I, you know, Dave, I, I love you, Dave. I love you, Anthony. I don't know you that well, Toby, but, you know, 
I, I really, you know. Look, I love you too, Phil, and reasonable people can disagree. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I understand your frustration. However, again, I'm just going to respectfully say that, uh, you know, you are right. Yes, um, you know, we could have get in, gone in harder and faster at the beginning. Um, you know, one of the things is that, you know, we were just coming in off the, um, the, the wave of COVID. Um, you know, a lot of people were struggling to get back on their feet. Uh, and there was a different climate in March than there is now. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. We always could do more and better. And even though we did have significant wins in this, it's not enough. So I have a question for you. If there is a no vote, would you be allowed to go back and go, our, our, our membership has said no to this, what can you do for us? Is that how that would work? Well, that is how that would work. But, but it, you know, in just saying no, no to what? What, it, what would be well, enough? No, well, first off, I go no to 3% because, you know, even though, like you pointed out, it's 10% in the grand scheme of things, basically the producers aren't paying more into the pension fund. The employees are by taking a, 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 a pay raise that's lower than inflation. Yeah. So, so the, we're the actually producers, the ones making so the so so that payment. The Phil, I understand the producers are doing a cost benefit analysis as well. Okay. They are saying, what is it going to cost us if there's a strike? And unlike the earlier negotiations where we were dealing mostly with companies that manufactured movies and, and, and received their, their significant re revenue streams from entertainment, we're now dealing with multinational corporations who make way more money selling phones, computers, delivering stuff from China, doing who knows what. And there's as much bargaining going on on the other side of the table as there is on this. And I guarantee you that Jeff Bezos and Tim Cook are going, you know what, if there's a strike, we're going to use it as a write-off for our other businesses while our competition eats itself alive. The union is weakened and we can hold out indefinitely because we're going to keep selling telephones and, and computers. Right. But look, we, I, we don't I, know. Look, honestly, you know, it is. Well, we were, real quick, I got yeah. I got to completely object to that. Only because Let me talk about this, call, Phil. Call me tomorrow. Only because, listen, Dave, you you got to remember, those people need content for those streaming services. We we're, we are working like mad people in Atlanta, Oklahoma, Florida, uh, Texas, Montana, California, New York. They're building. They just built three new studios in in Georgia. They built three new studios in New York. We got new studios being built in L.A. Nobody's going to want, those people are not going to want those things sitting empty. You know that. So I'm just saying, thanks for what you've done. I love you, but I got to vote you, Phil. So uh, let's talk you. tomorrow. We'll go in depth on this, okay? Uh, that sounds good. All right. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up. And Thank you, Tony. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Phil. Phil. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody who's participated. Um, be, we're going to be doing this again. Uh, we'll... We'll, we'll get the MOA. Well, that will get delivered. We'll probably do uh, a similar uh, question and answer. Um, you can email uh, your questions to business business agents at local forty business agents at local forty four dot org. Uh, we'll get to them. I, we, we've been um, just on with an onslaught of inquiries and things like that. So we will we'll do our best to get to them. And I know them. Very, very behind. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. I'm, I'm going to say it again. And, um, you know, I think one of the best ways we can keep this going is to ratify this agreement, to vote yes. And I know that it feels personal and there's some frustrations there. But there was a solidarity moment that got us the strike authorization and people put their issues aside. And I think there's, a, there's, there's value in voting yes on this agreement. And, and, and moving forward uh, and keeping it intact. And, and I, I have my concerns that we vote no, but I'm gonna vote yes. I hope everybody else sees the value in voting yes and building off this, uh, this agreement uh, going forward. I, I really do think this is a sea change. And uh, I think 
there's a risk of disrupting that. Um, I will say, so we will, uh, there will be a notification regarding some of the questions that came up about what, uh, what are the possibilities of uh, uh, rat not ratifying versus non-ratifying. That should be coming out shortly. And then um, thank you everybody. Uh, David, did you make an indication that you're gonna say? No, no. Anthony? Nothing? Oh. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. Good night. We will do this again. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Good, good night.